a smooth meeting with public participation via Zoom and webcast. Before we begin, here are some important guidelines and general instructions for the meeting. Please silence your communication devices such as your cell phone uh, or your desk phone. This will ensure we will not be hearing any feedback that can interrupt the meeting. During the meeting, all public participants, except for board members and district staff, will be placed on mute by the host. Public members will not be able to mute or unmute manually. Only the board members and staff will be visible on Zoom. Audio for members of the public will be unmuted once they are recognized to make a public comment. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comment. The clerk will recognize any public attendee who has indicated they wish to speak. So with that, we'll move on to roll call. Mr. Bessinger? Here. Mr. Chiesa? Here. Mr. Couch? Here. Ms. Fagazi? Ms. Lewis? Here. Mr. Mendez? Here. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Here. Mr. Pereira? Mr. Preciado? Mr. Reyes? Here. Mr. Rickman? Here. Dr. Sheriffs? Here. Ms. Shucklian? Here. Mr. Wheeler? Here. <clears throat> Mr. Peterson? And I am here as well. We have a quorum. Item number three is Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, if you would please stand and join me in the pledge. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number four is approval of consent calendar, item 17 through 20. Very good. Uh, so are there any changes or uh, amendments to the consent calendar? Move to approve. Second. Second. Very good. <gasps> we need to go to public comment on this, correct? So at this time, public comment. Through the chair, I see no public comment on this item. Okay, very good. Uh, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bessinger? Yes. Mr. Chiesa? Yes. Mr. Couch? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Dr. Sheriffs? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Shuklian? Ms. Shuklian. I'm sorry. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Aye. Motion passes. <laughs> Item number right five here. is One. public comment. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to public comment. This time is made available for comments from the public on matters within the board's jurisdiction that are not on the agenda. It is requested that no comments be made during this time, this period, on items on the agenda. The public may make comments on each board agenda item during the time allowed for public comment on that item. Attention is called to the fact that the board is prohibited by law from taking action on matters discussed that are not on the agenda. If you are particip participating via webcast, you will be uh, afforded the opportunity to address the governing board electronically during the appropriate comment periods by sending an email to webcast at valleyair.org. If you're part participating on Zoom video conference, please press participants button on the bottom of your screen and then raise your hand button on the participants list so that you may be recognized to speak. If you are participating on Zoom audio conference, please press star nine so that you may be recognized to speak. Also star six to mute or unmute yourself. Please be prepared to speak 
when your name or the last four digits of your phone number is called. Please state your name prior to beginning your public comment. So with that. First we have Connie Young. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great, hi, good morning. I'm Connie Young, a Fresno resident, retired registered nurse and volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, also known as CCL. It's my pleasure to greet the new members of the board and thank you for accepting this critically important responsibility of protecting the health of Valley residents. I am very concerned about climate change. For that reason, I've created my own agenda item for this topic, so it will be mentioned regularly at these meetings. Just as today, you'll be talking about another global threat that is affecting your work, the pandemic. You can expect, and I hope even look forward, to seeing me here almost every month. I'll provide information about climate science and solutions and the impacts climate change is having on air pollution and wildfires. Today's climate comment is about a study done by researchers at Harvard and several UK institutions. They found that air pollution caused by the burning of fossil fuels was responsible for 8.7 million deaths globally in 2018. A staggering one in five of all people who died that year. That's more than the combined total of people globally each year who die of malaria and from smoking tobacco. In the US, one in 10 deaths can be attributed to air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels. Other research has found that without fossil fuel emissions, the average life expectancy of the world's population would increase by more than a year, while global economic and health costs would fall by about $2.9 trillion. That's trillion. Of course, there's another reason to reduce fossil fuel pollution, a major driver of climate change. For that reason, Citizens Climate Lobby supports the Energy Innovation Act, which is expected to reduce carbon emissions by 40% in the first 12 years. The current administration takes climate change very seriously, and it's going to do something about it. The Energy Innovation Act uses the market rather than regulations to help incentivize the necessary transition to cleaner sources of energy and to cleaner air. I hope you will support this legislation when it's reintroduced in Congress this year. Thank you. Well, thank you for the agenda item, Ms. Young. <laughs> Next is Claire Statham. Good morning. My name is Claire Statham. I have addressed this board before on the topic of residential wood burning and the importance of educating the public uh, about the toxic effects of wood smoke. And today I have some comments and questions about one of the six most important educational information I see is its real air sign advisory network or RAN system. Now, my understanding is that an air quality report is specific to a particular time and location. For example, on February 8th, the PM 2.5 reading from the Fresno Garland Monitor at 7 p.m. was 22 or moderate, and two hours later it had risen to 94, very unhealthy. Well, at the Clovis Villa location, PM 2.5 topped at 40, moderate. So rapid changes over time and differences in reading between locations at the same time is just what one expects from air. So to my comments about the RAM system. The system's new interface allows Fresno residents to enter an address to learn, quote, the most up-to-date elderly air quality information in your neighborhood, unquote. Another list states, quote, check your neighborhood's current air quality, unquote. But when a friend and I tested the system using addresses from across Fresno, including locations on the west side in Castle and northeast Fresno and near Milburn and Herndon, locations that are miles apart from each other, the RAN system reported that not only was the air quality exactly the same at each location, but the chart showed that it had been the same every hour of the day. Given that gen air quality generally varies from location to location, it seems that RAN is reporting each, not each neighborhood's air quality, but is in fact reporting readings from a small 
the website's wording implies that the district has some technology that can tell you about air quality where you live. And that doesn't seem far back these days. People will believe that they are being given their neighborhood's air quality, not a reading from miles away. So my question is, am I wrong? Does the district have some means by which the residents the current air quality of their neighborhoods using the word neighborhood in the way everyday people use it? If not, then the old man says the inter interface would be just more honest. On it, Fresno residents picked Clovis or Fresno Garland if they wanted PM2.5. And yes, those reports taken miles from one's home might be highly inaccurate, but at least the public knew the truth about where the readings came from. They did not believe the readings were specific to their neighborhood, as the website now states. And so I would be more than happy to hear if I have misunderstood how the new interface works of the staff or anyone else. Thank you. And thank you. Sorry, we, we had a pretty poor cell connection there, so we got most of what you said, though. Um, further comments? Mr. Thomas Helm? Hi, uh, Thomas Helm. Uh, I'm the uh, new uh, EJAG vice chair. Um, I just wanted to come on public comment to uh, say hi and to also um, welcome uh, uh, Supervisor Vito Chiesa to the uh, Air District. Um, we're both from here in Stanislaus County, and I just wanted to say welcome, and uh, I hope you have fun. Um, I was just going to say that, but I do want to respond very quickly to the last comment. Um, I'll say I agree with both of the, the previous comments, um, and that um, some groups in the uh, nonprofit uh, sector, um, my nonprofit Valley Improvement Project is actually involved um, in a project where we're putting low-cost um, particulate matter monitors in different communities um, for that very reason. Um, for example, in Stanislaus County, there's the two monitors from the Air District in Modesto and Turlock. <coughs> if you live um, like in Patterson on the west side or, or Riverbank or Oakdale on the east side of the county, you're very far away from the monitors. Um, so it is, uh, you know, a nonprofit <laughs> project. Um, these are um, low-cost monitors uh, that are calibrated to to be more accurate, but they're not um, regulatory monitors like the the Air District has. But that is something that's um, being worked on by by different groups. Um, and there's a website sjvair.com that you can look at um, those monitors, and it's um, still being developed, but it's something that that uh, folks can check out. Um, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak. Thanks. Sabrina Lockhart. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sabrina Lockhart from the California Independent Petroleum Association. Just wanted to offer a little bit more context um, from Ms. Young's comments a little earlier. Uh, this report that she mentioned uh, does not name California specifically, and that's probably because we already have the toughest environmental protections for oil and gas. Uh, production in California. There are strict air quality programs administered statewide, federally, locally. You know, Valley Air's work is a good example of what's going on. There's air monitoring, reporting, and lots of regulations for our um, members to follow. The report also highlights the dangers of relying even more upon foreign oil, which is environmentally inferior. In fact, there was a University College London report earlier this year that found this spring, when foreign oil tanker um, ships idled off the coast for months, they emitted the same amount of pollution each day as 68,000 cars on the roads. And in the South Coast Air District, they predict that smog is going to become um, smog from tanker ships is going to become the number one source in just a few years. So, I just wanted to reiterate that continuing to meet the state. Huge energy needs with locally produced energy helps both our environment and our economy. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comment. Thank you. Janet Deeds Kamei. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Chairman and Board Members. This is Janet Deeds Kamei, and I would like to make a comment on climate change. I think that 
those of us in the Valley, especially those in the ag industry, are noticing that there are weather pattern changes as a result of climate change. And right now the country is suffering under one of the things that is happening more and more frequently as a result of climate change, and that is extreme weather events. We have extreme weather events during hurricane season. We have hurricane season that is lasting longer and beginning earlier. We have, now we have extreme winter events such as this uh, crippling uh, event happening in the middle of our country right now where the polar vortex has come down way lower than it normally does. We have extreme weather events in the summers here where the temperatures have gone higher, where the air is drier, where we are not getting the rain we used to get, so our trees are not hydrated in the forest. The beetles are able to take advantage of the weakness of our trees, and now they are killing the trees. And this is leading to mega fires that are becoming a norm. I think we need to stop being naysayers and look at facts and look at what is happening regarding climate change. Just give thought to the people now who haven't the energy to stay warm because they have the overloaded the grids. Feel sorry for the people who have run their water overnight so they don't lose their place and the water has pressure is very low throughout the area. Let's think about what is happening right now. And let's not be naysayers, let's look at the science and see what we can do to help reverse what is going on now, greenhouse gas problems. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Holmes. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Good morning, board. <clears throat> um, just wanted to sort of piggyback off of Janet's comments about you know, the disproportionate threats faced in our region by, you know, from global climate instability and just to celebrate this region's history of economic innovation and, you know, taking early action and that we don't have to wait until somebody forces us to do it. Um, I think this board has shown that it can try new things. I know that there are other air districts that just can't quite figure that out. And so I want to, I want to work with this board and communities to try new things. And I think the opportunity with the AB 617 process to use um, flexible funding to follow the will of the communities that are involved in that process to, um, you know, pilot non traditional programs. Uh, you know, that's something that's really on the community that I think the Air District is empowered to uh, support. And so, um, you know, we, we don't always have to um, pursue an economic vitality model that serves Los Angeles and the Bay Area. I'm frankly tired of being a second class Californian. And as much as I appreciate income and stability from uh, being a it's a beautiful region that people should want to live in first. And if we can take public health seriously and, you know, uh, pursuing policies that set this up as a first class region in the first class world that is California, that maybe we don't have to settle for less. So thank you all for you know your history of trying new things, and I hope we can continue to find ways to work together. Through the chair, I see no further public comment on this item. Um, I did want to announce that Councilmember Fagazi, Supervisor Pereira, and Mayor Pro Tem Preciado have joined the meeting. Very good. Thank you, Mr. I, chair. Just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michelle. No. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, just a quick response on some of the comments related to the uh, air quality app and uh, various air monitoring information. Uh, there, a lot of great points were, were raised and uh, want to let the board and the public know that later on in the year, uh, as we see more air monitoring going on and more technologies uh, uh, coming into play, variety of apps, I'm sure everybody's seen them, weather apps, air quality apps, ours is one of many, EPA has an updated um, app as well. 
I think it's time for some conversation you know, around sort of how, how that information is best shared and, and viewable by, by the public. So I just want to acknowledge the comments that were raised and, and let everybody know that I think a little bit later in the year as we take inventory of, of all, all that's going on kind of in that space that we hopefully have a great conversation about, you know, what the next steps are and, and how that, um, how we could best provide that information to the public, including the role of our app. So just want to acknowledge those comments and let folks know uh, that that's going to be in, in the works a little bit later on. Very good. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to item six, we do have a new board member with us today, and that is uh, council member, uh, Los Banos, uh, council member, Deborah Lewis. So uh, Ms. Lewis, thank you so much for, uh, joining the board and, and one of the first, uh, tasks that we always, uh, provide, um, or, or put upon your shoulders is to tell us a little bit about yourself and your experiences and, and how they led you here. And, uh, and, uh, so with that, welcome and love to hear your comments. Well, I hope everybody brought their blanket and pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I'll just start off by saying I've, I've always worked in public service um, from graduating from high, uh, college. I've always been in public service. And uh, it's been a pleasure of mine to serve people. And, and that's what I see uh, whether, uh, officials, whether you're appointed, whether you're elected, you're a servant to your people to do the best that you can for the communities that you represent. Um, I was born in New Orleans and uh, raised in San Diego, grew up in San Diego, moved to San Jose and went to college to San Jose State. And after graduation, uh, started working in government with Santa Clara County. And after retirement, um, well, actually, before retirement, I was on the uh, planning commission for Los Banos and uh, served on some other committees. Um, the first black female in Merced County to hold an elected office, so I'm, I'm proud of that. And um, so I, I was appointed to the Merced County Fair back in 2006 and served on that board for about nine years. And um, so here I am uh, appointed and elected by the uh, cities within my county to serve on this board. Uh, certainly there are a bunch of other boards and committees that I've sat on in between, but you know, there's just not enough time to go into all of that. But I, I'm very honored to serve with all of you and I look forward to um, having some input uh, into the organization and how things move forward for the future of the uh, San Joaquin Valley. And thank you for having me and thank you for asking me uh, to give you a little bit of background uh, for myself. I, uh, just one other thing, I, I do have one son. Uh, I'm very proud of him. Uh, and I always like to brag because uh, he works for the Warriors and um, he, uh, he um, controls the shot clock for the Warriors. So um, I had a birthday recently and one of the retired basketball players, uh, Sean Livingston, who's my absolute favorite, uh, my son um, had him call me and do a FaceTime to wish me a happy birthday. So naturally I was awestruck and without words. <laughs> But um, I've had some pretty awesome things happen in life, and that was one of them. <laughs> and uh, one last thing, uh, and I did say a last thing, uh, I, I developed some bucket list things that I want to do in, in life. And uh, one of them that I did was um, uh, about 11 years ago, I learned uh, how to ride a motorcycle and bought a Harley and rode to <laughs> Arizona with the Buffalo Soldiers. So that was a great feat for me. So thank you for your time. I appreciate being here and I'm, I'm excited about being on this board. Well, then uh, a big welcome to you and, and a little bit of who dat. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, uh, on a sadder note, uh, one of our previous board members uh, passed 
recently, uh, Supervisor Jerry O'Bannon served on this board for a number of years, and uh, Supervisor Pereira knew him fairly well and, and would ask him to maybe just say a few words. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Peterson. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was my honor to, to serve on the Merced County Board of Supervisors with uh, with Jerry O'Banion. You know, Jerry uh, had served for uh, 28 years, and when um, us young guys got on the board, he would always uh, be willing to mentor us and teach us. Uh, you know, the experience that he had. Um, but unfortunately, uh, he well he did retire. Uh, he retired two years ago. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he passed away on February 12th, and um, really a, a sad day for, for all of us in Merced County, especially on the west side where Jerry served, which uh, included communities of uh, Dos Palos, where he grew up and was a farmer, and then, uh, of course, Los Banos, San Anela, South Dos Palos, and Volta. And um, Jerry uh, served on the uh, board here at the district from... February of 1995 uh, until December of 2002. And uh, he always talked about the impact that uh, the Air District was making and how proud he was of, uh, of being a part of that. Uh, you know, Jerry was uh, you know, just a great man. He was uh, worked diligently for his constituents and uh, he, he'll be missed by all of us. And so uh, thank you, uh, Chair Peterson, for giving me a, a moment of honor him here. Very, very well deserved on Mr. O'Banion's behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Prayer, and, and uh, certainly we send all the best to his family. So, uh, uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to item six. Item number six is report on District Citizens Advisory Committee activities. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Want to. Uh, Quickly start by saying uh, congratulations on uh, being reappointed uh, to the chair, Mr. Chair, and, and, uh, and your uh, and your vice chair. I would also like to welcome all the new members uh, on behalf of the CAC, and you know, extend an olive branch to any of the new members and, and and sitting members that if you would like to attend and see the liaison between the Citizens Advisory Committee, very diverse group of individuals working on many of the same issues that come before the board on the agenda items, uh, please uh, reach out. We'd, we'd love to have you a part of that process. On to the report on agenda item number six, um, normal updates as part of the CAC from the APCO and, and the deputies and staff members. I would say the significance of uh, the, the last meeting had to do with the recommendation from uh, Mr. Jordan to actually put together a letter to Governor Newsom, uh, Pro Tem Atkins, and, and Speaker Rendon supporting uh, the current governor's budget. We realize there'll be a May revise. Most importantly, uh, the, the funding mechanisms with farmer uh, healthy soils, of course, the extension of Carl Moyer, uh, the car lower carbon um, transportation element, and especially the wildfire response and mitigation. So I believe that is in your board packet. And uh, great, great uh, unanimous vote of support for um, those incentive fundings. As all of you know, we've got price tags on virtually all of the regulatory programs from a whole suit of agencies across the state. Um, we're, we're woefully underfunded. And quite frankly, we're going to have a very difficult time meeting the SIP agreements and, and um, that we've we've agreed to do in most of these uh, without a significant increase in in voluntary incentive funding. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll say one thing, uh, Miss Lewis. It's great to uh, have a fellow Harley rider. I would highly recommend as someone that has traveled across the country, uh, East Coast or West Coast to East Coast on his bike, keep going east, ma'am, because it gets more and more beautiful the further east you go. So with that, Mr. Chairman, if there's any questions. Thank you. I don't we have any questions, but uh, with that, we'll move on to item seven. Item seven is extend agreement to administer Carl Moyer Memorial Air Quality Standards Attainment Program funds on behalf of Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Todd DeYoung, your Director of Grants and Incentives here at the Air District. Um, I am here this morning seeking your approval to extend a current agreement that we have to administer Carl Moyer Memorial Air Quality Standards Attainment Program funds on behalf of the Great Basin Air Pollution Control District. Just by way of a brief background on what the Carl Moyer Program is, it's a state-funded voluntary incentive program named after the late Dr. Carl Moyer. Um, it's, it's considered to be the first and the most long-standing uh, voluntary incentive program in the state, um, and it's, it's kind of provided the blueprint for um, a lot of programs that have come since. Um, it was launched in 1998 and has provided over a billion dollars in voluntary incentives statewide. Um, it's aimed at cost-effectively reducing emissions from mobile equipment and vehicles, primarily through equipment turnover and fleet modernization. And it, and it really targets over the past uh, heavy-duty diesel equipment and getting uh, emission reductions through uh, upgrading heavy-duty um, equipment, including on and off-road. Um, it's implemented by local air districts, um, and our air district receives approximately $13 million a year in Carl Moyer program funds, but that, that amount is actually uh, increasing over the next several years. So the district has been implementing this program um, since 1999. We've utilized Carl Moyer program funding within our successful heavy duty engine incentive program um, to reduce emissions and impacts from, from diesel equipment uh, throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Primarily we fund equipment replacement, retrofits and repower, which is per, um, replacing the engine inside of an existing piece of equipment to cleaner technology, generally going from uncontrolled or tier one or tier two diesel equipment out to the latest tier um, diesel equipment, um, electric and um, natural gas technology as well. Um, the emission reductions that are gained through this program are surplus to any state or local regulations. And what this means is that um, the emission reductions that we gain from this program are early. Um, they're done before uh, the regulatory requirements would require them to do so or they go beyond what the regulation would require. They're extra um, in addition to what the regulations would require. Through the years, the district has been praised by the California Resources Board for administering, or administering highly efficient and effective incentive programs um, during our most recent audits. Um, the district has been approached because of this um, reputation um, by several neighboring air districts to either assist with the administration of their Carl Moyer program funds or to accept unused funds as an alternative to sending those funds back to CARB. Um, through the years, we've partnered with Mojave Desert, Antelope Valley, uh, Tuolumne County, and most recently, the Great Basin Air Pollution Control District. Um, we've actually been partnering with the Great Basin Air Pollution Control District since 2008 um, to accept their yearly allotment of Carl Moyer program funds. And through that time, we've received more than $2.9 million in funds. This includes both project uh, funds and funds to administer the program on their behalf. Um, our most recent allotment um, from the Great Basin Air Pollution Control District was $225,159, and that amount is increasing slightly each year. Um, recognizing that reducing pollution in the San Joaquin Valley benefits the Great Basin, which is located just on the other side of the Sierras from us. Their, their office is located in Bishop, so you kind of know where, where Great Basin is. Um, so they, they um, identified that, that getting emission reductions here actually helps with their air quality in their region. Um, so they've decided to direct all of their funds to us on an annual basis for use on projects within the Valley. And as a condition of accepting these funds, the district assumes all associated administrative reporting, tracking, and matching responsibilities that go along with, with operating the program. Um, our current agreement with the Great Basin is set to expire this year. And so the Great Basin has recently reached out to the district and indicated their intent to continue this partnership, which has been successful with the district for an additional five years. So approval of today's item would extend the existing partnership with Great Basin to accept and administer these Carl Moyer program funds on their behalf for an additional five years. It would authorize the executive director to sign a letter of designation of the Moyer program funds from Great Basin to the district for an additional five years, and then authorize the board chair on behalf of your board to sign a letter of appreciation, really thanking the Great Basin for their ongoing partnership in this important program. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Very good, thank you. 
Any questions, comments from the board? Seeing none, motion to accept. Yeah, I'll make a motion. Second. Very good. We have a motion and second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Oh, yep. We'll do that. <laughs> Through the chair, I see no public comment on this item. See, I just knew. <laughs> oh, one second. It looks like a board member. I saw a hand raised by one of the board members. Uh, Dr. Sheriffs has a comment. No, oh, I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to, you know, thank the, the, the staff for this. It's a great recognition partnership community. Uh, Emphasize both with ARB and with the, the other air districts and the great job the district has done, the transparency and the years. What would also remind everyone that Carl Diesel, this is one of the most in terms of health because diesel, uh, particularly better in particular, is uh, one of the absolutely most unhealthful uh, pollutants that we do. Um, and as well as upgrading the Moira program also, I think, importantly, helps drive technology. And I think that's, that's, that's another critical aspect of incentive programs and being involved in incentive programs, that it helps um, promote these uh, cleaner uh, bring them to, to market so absolutely much in favor of this and appreciate the hard work of staff thank you any further comment to the chair see no further comment on this item okay would please call the roll mr bessinger yes mr chiesa yes i'm sorry okay that's okay mr couch yes Ms. Vagazi. Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Yes. Mr. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Dr. Sheriffs? Yes. Ms. Shuklian? Yes. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? And I vote aye. Motion passes. Item number eight is approved voluntary emission reduction agreement with Fryant Water Authority to mitigate air quality impacts. Morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Brian Clements, and I'm the director of permit services. And today I'll be presenting on the voluntary emission reduction agreement uh, with the Fryant Water Authority. So starting with, the, with VERA key concepts, um, since 2005, VERAs have been used as an innovative California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA mitigation measure um, to, to reduce air quality impacts from development projects. Uh, VERAs are a contract uh, between the district and a project proponent or, or developer and provide an enforceable uh, mechanism for lead agencies to mitigate project emissions through their environmental review process. Uh, through the lead agency application process, developers implement on-site uh, mitigation measures and project design elements. And VERAs then serve as an additional mitigation measure to complement these project design elements um, and, and achieve additional emission reductions. Avera can be implemented to address air quality impacts from, from both construction and operational phases of a project. It's important to note that your board's approval of any Veras assure proper mitigation of air quality impacts, but in no way signify approval or, or endorsement of the development project by the district. Any approval discretion of, of the development project continues to rest with the lead agency. Under VERA's developers provide pound for pound mitigation of their project emissions uh, through a process that funds and implements clean air projects, also known as emission reduction projects. Uh, by way of the district's highly successful emission reduction incentive grant program, uh, the district administers grants on behalf of the developers where these, these funds are reinvested in the valley 
and are awarded to Valley businesses, residents, and municipalities to generate real reductions in emissions that are also surplus of existing rules. Um, clean air project selection priority goes to those near the location of the increases to maximize benefits to the local communities. Through Avera and, and the subsequent grant administration, developers are assured of cost-effective reductions. The district also quantifies and enforces the emission reductions generated by the Vera, and, and as a result, the district will certify that the developer has, has mitigated the project's emissions required by the lead agency. As, as mentioned, these agreements are administered by the district and provide funding toward clean air projects in the, in the valley on behalf of the developer. With 15 years of experience, the program has demonstrated success uh, through 46 agreements executed uh, to date and over 9,600 tons of emissions reduced. Again, those reductions go beyond those required by rules such as the district's indirect source review rule and, and other regulations. VERA serve as a complementary and an additional mitigation measure option under CEQA for elite agencies. And since the funds are paid to the district prior to construction or operation, mitigation is, is achieved before or simultaneously with, with those project increases. And, and through this process, no refunds um, are, are given if the project develop, um, if, if the development project is canceled or, or downsized and the district has already um, utilized the money towards emission reduction projects. So the district has numerous grant programs that utilize uh, VERA funds uh, to reduce air pollution in the valley, in including a whole the host of projects listed here to assist businesses, school districts, municipalities, and residents. Um, so, some examples are replacing diesel-powered off-road equipment, um, such as tractors, replacing old trucks um, with new low-emitting trucks, um, replacing older high-polluting high school buses, replacing older transit buses and other vehicles, um, purchasing clean um, personal vehicles and, and repairing those older vehicles, as well as replacing fireplaces and wood-burning stoves with uh, natural gas inserts and other clean-burning certified units. As discussed, VERAs rely on the district's successful incentive grant programs, which are integral to the execution of those mitigation agreements. Uh, program, program success has been demonstrated by way of over $3.5 billion invested in clean air projects through, through these grant programs and over 189,000 tons of emissions reduced over the years. State audits commend the district as a shining example for effectiveness and efficiency. And there is a constant high demand across a variety of incentive programs um, due to this reputation established and re um, relationships with, with local agencies, businesses, and other stakeholders. So the subject of today's agreement is the Friant Kern Canal Middle Reach Capacity Correction Project. The project consists of restoring the original Friant Kern Canal design capacity by doing two primary things. One is raising the portions of the embankments of the existing canal for approximately 13 miles, and, all, and then also constructing a new realigned canal segment for approximately 20 miles. The project will be implemented by the Friant Water Authority and the Bureau of Reclamation, both serving as lead agencies under CEQA and the National Environmental Policy Act, or, or NEPA. The two agencies prepared a joint state and environmental impact report, environmental impact statement, or EIR-EIS. The EIR-EIS requires NOx emissions from the project's construction to be mitigated to below the district's NOx significant threshold of 10 tons per year. And then as such, the, today's agreement satisfies the mitigation measure from the certified EIR-EIS by mitigating those said project NOx emissions to below the significant threshold of 10 tons per year, achieving the estimated mitigation required of 10.48 tons of NOx. Um, the, the estimated mitigation funds to do so is $101,908. Once those funds are utilized towards clean air projects, the district will certify mitigation uh, to the Friant Water Authority when um, that, that the emission reductions are achieved and, and the VERA is fulfilled. With that, the recommendations are to approve the VERA with the Friant Water Authority to receive those funds 
to mitigate air quality impacts from the project and also authorize staff to identify, fund, and manage emission reduction projects to mitigate those air quality impacts from the project. So with that, I'll return to the board for discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Okay, uh, questions from the board. Seeing none. It looks like Dr. Sheriffs has a question. Thank you. I'm, I'm always confused. I haven't had my coffee yet this morning, so. The, uh, you know, this, 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 this highlights, uh, one, the importance of, and also the quality of the science that the Air District is involved in. Because I look at these numbers and we're looking at pound for pound mitigation. Uh, these are require very precise calculations. And, you know, I'm looking at this project that we're talking about. Um, you know, and we're talking $100,000 and, you know, other things we're talking about, hundreds of millions. Uh, and although this seems like a small project and a small number, um, the task we have for us, these, these numbers matter. Ten tons of NOx make a difference. Um, and we're mitigating a little over ten tons to get this project below um, ten tons. Um, so it, 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 it highlights the uh, challenges and the importance of the task and how careful uh, we have to be and we are. So thanks, thanks, thanks to staff on, on working this. I'm glad you can, can have confidence in these numbers. Thank you. Did you say no further questions from the board? Supervisor Wheeler, it looks like he has his hand raised. Yeah. Okay, Supervisor yeah, thank Wheeler. You. Yeah, thank you. I just, the importance of this is so important right now. We can't afford to lose a drop of water and redoing some of the parts of that canal is so important. So uh, I I really thank them for doing this and, this, and, and also doing the Vera. It's really nice when these, uh, different construction companies and different projects step up the plate. So thank you. Thank them. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, so any further board member questions? I see no further board member questions. I, we do have public comment. Okay. Very good. Christine Zimmerman. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning to the board and to staff and to everyone who's uh, tuned in this morning. I just wanted to take a quick moment to highlight for the newer board members um, and to acknowledge and thank the district and, and its staff for the remarkable work that they've done with the VERA program and with the previous agenda item, the Moyer program. Industry has worked so hard with the district and we've made um, what I consider to be remarkable strides in emission reductions. But right alongside with our efforts in the private sector, these funding programs have been so valuable and essential to what the district has been able to accomplish in continuing to advocate for these funding programs to draw dollars in at the state and federal level to support these programs is as essential as the work we do in the private sector to drive technology. These programs help continue to drive technology and, and to get us where we are. So I just wanted to to draw the, the newer board members' attention to these programs and, and just play up how incredibly important and successful they are and just thank the district and their staff for the work they've done in this space. Thanks very much. Thank you. Further comments? Through the chair, I see no further public comment on this item. Very good. Supervisor Mendez. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Yep. We have a motion and multiple seconds. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bessinger? Yes. Mr. Chiesa? Aye. Mr. Couch? Yes. Ms. Vagazzi? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco-Werner? Yes. 
Mr. Pereira? Uh, yes. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Dr. Sheriffs? Yes. Ms. Shuklian? Aye. Mr. Wheeler? Yes, yes. Mr. Peterson? And I vote aye. Motion passes. Item number nine is update on district's response to COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Morgan Lambert, one of the deputy air pollution control officers here at the district. And today, um, as we are kind of nearing the, the, the one year anniversary, I guess, of when we started really taking some drastic measures in response to the pandemic here in the state and, and specifically here at the district, we thought it would be a, a good idea to provide um, an update on um, kind of where we are at as the district and some of the things we're seeing externally as well. Um, so I'll start off a little bit with uh, a little bit of background just because we have several new board members today um, just to make sure that they're uh, um, aware of uh, the district's efforts to date and then um, we'll kind of transition to give some updates on um, what we've been seeing regarding air quality and some other uh, factors that, that affect ultimately affect air quality. Um, so with that, uh, the, the district has and continues to take a, a very proactive approach to responding to the, the pandemic. Um, you know, following all the directives and guidelines and recommendations from the various local, state, and federal officials. Um, and in doing that, because we are an agency that, that serves all eight counties here in the Valley, as well as the over 50 cities that we have here in the Valley, having to do that with balancing um, all the different directives that we have seen come out across all those different um, uh, local communities and from the, the, the health staff in those, those counties. And so really uh, having to keep abreast of all those things and, and making changes and tweaks to our, our response um, to address those specific needs as we continue uh, to do our business here. The goals of our response to date um, that the, the board has set out is, is ensuring obviously the safety and well-being of not only our staff, but as well as uh, all the stakeholders um, that, that we interact with and come into contact with, as well as you know, being uh, good stewards for the community and making sure that we're uh, being protective of the communities at large that we, uh, that we operate within. And then also uh, equally important is that we continue to provide the essential air quality public services uh, to residents, businesses, and others served by the district. We are uh, 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 a community, essential um, air quality agency, a public health agency, and so we've um, uh, developed all of our strategies to address this with, uh, with the role of trying to maintain um, our essential operations and be um, able to serve the community. So obviously in doing that, we've had to implement uh, many new practices um, here in our, our, our offices as well as uh, in our engagements um, with the community. We've had to increase all the cleaning and disinfecting throughout the district offices and vehicles to keep people safe. We've had to put in place uh, social distancing measures among staff and the general public, um, both those that we may interact with um, here within the offices, as well as those interactions that we have out in public as we go about our, our activities. Um, we've put in place COVID symptom screening measures for all staff and the general public that may enter our offices or that for our staff that are going out into the public and potentially interacting with people. Um, and uh, obviously with the, the appropriate um, responses um, to those screening procedures, if potentially people have symptoms or other things in place that, that dictate some response. Um, per local and state guidance, we have continued our operations by utilizing a range of remote work and telecommuting options. Um, we've put in place face covering requirements. We've suspended all non-essential work travel um, to help aid with uh, keeping our, our employees uh, in the community safe. We also have in place a, a worksite COVID-19 prevention plan um, to protect the health of staff and the public in our offices and uh, kind of help guide us um, um, along the path to resuming normal operations uh, once uh, recommendations and guidelines um, you know, allow that and, and, and suggest that that should be, should be happening. Um, we, uh, again, the, the main focus that we've been having has also been on continuing essential public services. We rapidly developed and implemented measures aimed at maintaining um, continuity of our critical services. Um, we've been able to maintain all of our air monitoring, forecasting, burn management services, our enforcement of air quality regulations and complaint response, um, permitting and small business assistance functions, um, all of our uh, 
uh, Voluntary Incentive or, or Clean Air Grant uh, Administration. Um, we've uh, the 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 going to the remote work as well as implementing uh, new electronic workflows and adjusting our, our practices and policies on how we do some of our field work has enabled us to continue to operate and continue to provide um, the level of service and meet all of our, our, our mandates that we have um, from both the, the state and, and federal government um, under our, our plans and under our agreements that we have. Um, the, the board has also put in place a, a, a suite of economic assistance measures uh, to help residents as businesses that are you know, facing um, economic uh, consequences as the result of the pandemic. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. And that overall, um, the district has been very successful in being able to continue to provide our essential services while maintaining the high level of productivity, accessibility, and customer service that people have come to, to expect um, from the district. And I am happy to report that when we look at all the key metrics that we have here, um, we have not seen any significant drop off in the terms of the work that we're able to get done um, over the last year through the pandemic. Going to the, specifically to the economic assistance initiative, as, as you may recall back in April, your board adopted a suite of emergency economic assistance relief measures um, aimed at, at um, you know, providing some uh, measure of relief to residents at businesses that the district regulates that may have to, for example, pay fees to us. Um, in December of 2020, looking at where we were uh, in, in the pandemic um, and uh, recognizing that, that we were not near an end at this point in time, the board took action to extend those measures through the end of 2021 to continue that, that relief. Um, to date, uh, we've, we've processed approximately 875 requests, um, and those have been approved under this initiative, primarily for the, the waiver of potential late fees associated with, with permitting and other application projects that people may have before us, as well as the extension of payment deadlines, allowing people to go on installment plans and things of that nature to help, um, help spread out and, and make it easier, the ability to, to pay for those services um, that we've provided. Obviously, another key factor of what we do is our engagement with Valley stakeholders. Um, effective public engagement is very critical to our on, ongoing activities, and it was no different during the, the time of the pandemic. Um, and it obviously uh, created many challenges to, to doing a, and, and need to change the models that we've used in the past on how we do effective engagement. So we've been working uh, uh, quite uh, strongly with Valley stakeholders to implement um, new clean air incentive programs, new regulatory measures, all the work that we've been doing under AB 617. And we've had to come up with new tools and approaches to be able to do that, um, to be able to engage and provide service to residents, businesses, and other stakeholders. And those have included many of the features you see here today, like online and telephone meeting tools for public meetings and hearings, um, enhanced web resources, such as um, permitting and grant applications uh, submittal portals and other electronic uh, means of doing business. Um, although we are still maintaining all of the, the traditional ways of people being able to do business with us and papers and faxes and things for those people that, that prefer to take advantage of, of those methods. Um, and given the, the impact on resources throughout Valley sectors and, and to residences, we've also found um, the need and have provided additional time and consideration uh, necessary to ensure effective engagement. And that, that could mean extending commenting deadlines on certain projects that we're working with, holding potentially additional meetings with people to make sure that, that uh, the, they're able to effectively engage and participate in our processes. So to shift a little bit now um, to some of the external impacts that we've been seeing as part of the, the pandemic, uh, back in June, um, we had, we had pre pre presented some information that was looking at um, air quality impacts of the, of the pandemic and, and as well as some of the, the economic trends that we had been seeing. And so um, this is kind of an update on that based on, on where we sit today. Um, Obviously, the district is uh, actively tracking the ec economic impacts of the pandemic. Um, it's very important to us to understand um, th these impacts, especially within the Valley, as we you know, move forward with many of the mandates that we have to do under our planning efforts, as well as under um, some of our other legal mandates that we have under AB 617. It's important to understand these impacts and, and to, to, to be able to uh, account for those as we go through our, our processes and, and develop potentially new regulations or, or other strategies to, to comply with some of those mandates. Um, clearly, the economic disruption is happening on a global, national, and local levels. Um, we've seen very severe impacts to Valley residents and businesses, um, and there's, there's many 
you know, models out there, obviously, that are predicting various uh, recovery scenarios um, that are dependent on many different factors, um, some of which are optimistic, some of which are more pessimistic. And so we've been trying to take a balanced approach as we've been doing socioeconomic work and, and trying to look at different scenarios and projecting um, kind of where we think the, the, the recovery may be. Um, on a national level, the, the World Bank is currently estimating that the, the global economy um, shrank by about 4.3% uh, in, in 2020. Um, they are projecting, though, growth of the economy um, by about 4% in 2021 and 3.8% in 2022. But these are still well below, I mean, somewhere around maybe half the projections that they had pre-COVID uh, pre pandemic. Um, and in making many of these forecasts, uh, the World Trade Organization is, is forecasting what they consider to be a weak recovery model rather than a, a, a quick rebound to that. And so obviously that's something that we're um, taking into consideration and are cognizant of. On the statewide front, um, there's been, as, as you all are very aware, um, significant losses to jobs um, across the state. I think up to about 1.4 million jobs in 2020 were lost and you know, across all different uh, industry sectors, but obviously um, hitting um, you know, the leisure and hospitality, the, the, the restaurant um, industry is you know, very, very hard. Um, the, uh, um, with peak unemployment that we saw back in April of, of last year, as we reported early in the year, there has been a, a, a downward trend in that over the last several years, but um, you know, a December was the first time over several months that we actually saw that starting to go back up a little bit, um, I'm assuming with some of the new measures that were put in place in December by the governor at that time. Um, in looking at the, the governor's proposed budget and the economic forecast that he had in there, um, the, the state is estimating uh, under their projections right now that they think it'll take about six years to see a full recovery to the, the pre-pandemic um, job rates that we had. They had a couple of other estimates as well, um, but that's basically on order with what, what we saw during the, the Great Recession. Um, so um, very significant and looking like it's going to be an extended period of time before um, we get back to those uh, pre-pandemic levels um, if we do. The, uh, the, the, the current budget that the state has proposed is, is a little interesting in that they are projecting kind of a one-year windfall of revenues and and are acting accordingly under that. But as part of that, that same budget, they are um, projecting budget deficits of $7.6 billion in 2022-2023, 2022, and then that, that deficit to grow to $11 billion in 2024-2025. So um, obviously without uh, changes to expenses or revenues, um, the, the state is currently forecasting uh, pretty significant budget deficits uh, moving forward. Getting a little bit uh, more local here, just to looking at the, the economic impacts of the valley and, and focusing on unemployment rates. Obviously, the, the San Joaquin Valley and the unemployment rates we see here are generally higher than, than what we see elsewhere um, in the state and in the, the U.S. as a whole. As a whole. Um, but very similar to the state, we saw peak unemployment rates back in, in April and have been generally trending down, um, although with a little bit of a, a spike again in, in December. Um, as of the end of December, the average unemployment rate was about 10.8% here in the Valley um, with a high of 11.8% in, in Tulare County. So pr very significant um, unemployment rate still, um, especially when comparing it to December of last year um, and, and obviously highlighting the, the economic conditions that we're still facing here as a result of the pandemic. To, to look a little bit now, switching to kind of the air quality and, and what, if any, impacts the pandemic has had on air quality, um, we kind of looked initially um, at vehicle activity uh, as kind of a surrogate. Um, and, and specifically, we looked at vehicle activity along the 99 between Bakersfield and Stockton um, using some data that, that Caltrans has had. And we're comparing that data from February to December of 2019, so pre-pandemic, to those same months in, in 2020. And looking both at total vehicle miles traveled as well as heavy duty truck only vehicle miles traveled. So back in June when we initially presented this, you can kind of see the, especially on the, the chart on the left and the left side of that chart, um, we were, we, when the first statewide shelter in place went in, in place, we really saw a big uh, dip in um, the amount of vehicle miles that were being traveled in that, that April, March, April, May uh, timeframe with April seeing almost a 42% decrease in the amount of vehicle miles traveled. Um, when we first presented this in June, we started 
to see a recovery from that and coming out of that and going back more to normal levels. And as you can see on the chart, um, since June, we, we've, we've basically been around the, the normal levels that, that we've seen, we saw last year. So kind of, kind of a return to normal with just a slight decrease or change from, from 2019. On the, the right side of that graph um, shows the, the heavy duty truck only portion. Um, similar kind of conclusions that the, is that we've, we've pretty much returned to normal um, levels there. And the, the, the actual decrease there was, was much less um, than we saw on the, the, the total vehicle miles traveled. Um, obviously, you know, more, more, more light duty vehicle trips were being removed than the heavy duty trips that were necessary for goods movement even during the, 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 the stay at home order that was put in place. Now, how does that translate to, to air quality? So we looked at a couple of metrics that, that kind of translate from there, one of which is um, um, night NO2 concentrations, which are generally attributed to uh, near road and, and, and vehicle uh, emissions, um, as well as ozone um, uh, concentrations over that time as well. And uh, as you can see from most of these charts here, we did, especially when you're looking at the ozone charts, we did see uh, a little bit of a drop in the early parts of the of the um, the the pandemic, um, as we did see those drops in vehicle miles traveled, but since that time, it's basically returned back up to kind of what we would consider to be more average or, or projected levels. Um, I will note that that in some of this this information as well, um, we do have wildfire impacts and other things as well that are driving up um, some of the emissions in the, the latter half of of 2020. Um, you know, towards that five-year average. So overall, we, were, we would have expected to see a little bit of a decline just as, as, as ozone concentrations continue to, to improve here in the valley, but we did have some wildfire impacts on the backside. But, <clears throat> but the, the kind of the takeaway from this, though, is that although we did see some, some uh, reductions in, in air quality uh, levels, um, at, the, at the early parts of the pandemic due to the reductions in vehicle miles traveled, as we've seen those rebound, we, we've seen um, air quality that's more consistent with what, what we would expect again. So looking ahead to recovery, um, obviously the, the California economy has begun to reopen slowly and in stages. Um, we're continuing to maintain the safety of, of our staff stakeholders in the community through implementation um, of the recommendations that local, state, and federal health officials have, including the continued utilization of um, expanded telecommuting and re remote work capabilities. We're still working hard to ensure effective communication with stakeholders and, and the community as we go through our processes and, and, and comply with the mandates that we have. Um, continuing the economic assistance uh, measures that your board put in place and has extended through the end of 2021. And then also looking for and, and trying to advocate for additional resources to assist in, in maintaining essential services uh, to the extent that they, they are out there. Um, we're continuously evaluating the circumstances and additional measures um, to the extent and, and as necessary um, as the economic impacts are, are better understood and we continue to, to look at all the different um, forecasts that are out there to help inform our processes as we're moving forward. And then obviously, uh, you know, consistent with our mission here as an agency, we're, we're continuing to prioritize uh, progress towards attainment of health-based air quality standards and public engagement in our processes. And, and as I stated before, um, even with all these changes and the drastic things that we've had to do, we really haven't slowed down in terms of uh, moving forward with our mission and, and the, the work that we do here at the district. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to the board for any questions they may have. Thank you, Morgan. Questions from the board, comments? Yeah, I, I, I guess I can speak for uh, my colleagues as county supervisors and the frustration and of uh, this whole process and, you know, being deemed as the public health officers for, uh, you know, the Central Valley and uh, the rollout of the vaccine and very fluid, very frustrating, you know, this week starting this uh, new third party administrator um, process where uh, the state has shifted the responsibility of the vaccine rollout to uh, the third party administrator and and then moving, uh, you know, all of uh, the requests for vaccines to uh, something called my turn app and and uh, in our county, uh, we're all already experiencing some major difficulties with this app and and, uh, you know, from allowing people from outside the area to, uh, you know, flood our region to, to sign up for um, the vaccine and, um, you know, this just goes on and on and on. So, um, 
very frustrating, and and uh, I, I think I I wouldn't sell it short as you know statewide. Every agency that's been responsible is really frustrated with uh, the state rollout, and and uh, but we're working hard to uh, try and get this thing better, but. The limitation is also vaccine, and, and uh, those numbers are starting to get a little better, but uh, still challenging here in the Central Valley. So uh, with that, uh, Don, your, uh, <laughs> Dr. Pacheco Warner. Hi, yes. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you so much, um, staff, for all your work um, that you've continued to do during the pandemic to move these great efforts forward. Um, I just wanted to note that there was also, I know that you mentioned a lot of the, the economic impact, um, and I wanted to note that the, this month the CDC published a report <coughs> on the provisional life expectancy estimates um, in which it found that the U.S. life expectancy actually lowered a year, uh, by a whole year, um, due to the pandemic, um, which, is, which is pretty significant um, when you're talking about the entire country. and. Um, and the life expectancy is lower in such a short period of time. I do want to note that f that for um, non-Hispanic Black people, it actually lowered 2.7 years, and um, for for Hispanic individuals, almost two years at 1.9. And I mention this because it overlaps with so much, um, and and it brings even more urgency to the work that we're doing here. Um, because of the detrimental impacts that the pandemic has had on individuals and therefore um, really anything that we can do to mitigate um, the, the air quality um, effects on health um, will be of great help to our entire communities that we serve. And, and so I just think, you know, this, this really is a for me, this report was kind of a, a call to really double down on all of our efforts um, for attainment of quali air quality standards that we now have. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sheriff. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Pacheco Warner, thank you for your year. The, 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 that just um, magnifies the disparities that, that relate to uh, air pollution and climate impacts on health uh, and how, how, how important, uh, magnifying how important our work is. Um, I have a question for staff being wanting to be a little optimistic um, as we get vaccines out there, as we overcome vaccine hesitancy, as the public continues to mask and distance and we get the uh, pandemic under control, how's that for optimism? What, what, what lessons have we learned about all of this remote uh, work and upgrading the web and, and how, how different will the Air District look in a year in terms of how we're providing services? Uh, what, 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 are, what are the suggestions about how much space we need and about uh, the value of people doing uh, work remotely potentially? So if there are any staff comments about that because we the district's been very proactive in terms of of, of back in march uh working for safety of pay of our staff and the public and so i'm i'm wondering about how how, how we are looking ahead thank you yes, mr. mr chair just provide a, a brief response and thank you dr sheriffs that's a great question and and uh and i also want to just confirm and, and reaffirm the point that Dr. Pacheco uh, Warner raised, which, which we've actually been using in our advocacy efforts, for example, with the governor on the budget process and other similar uh, areas, you know, to really highlight the importance of, of doubling down, getting the funding, for example, here and making the connection actually to the, um, the importance of that as it relates to, to air quality. So I really, really appreciate you bringing that up. 
But on, on the issue of uh, the uh, major advancements that, uh, that we've made and, and sort of what that looks like coming out of the pandemic, and uh, I will you know, uh, also be an optimist, I think, in, in uh, <laughs> trying to frame this, this uh, discussion a little bit uh, you know, from my perspective. Um, but you know, a couple of things. You know, one, I think the star work culture and the, the board's uh, priority for being innovative and in how we do our business we're both uh, uh, paramount in, in our ability to transition as quickly as we did when we launched the emergency uh, COVID uh, measures you know, back in March, uh, consistent with the board's direction. We were already well positioned to be looking at telecommuting, had already done quite a bit of work to create efficient online programs, great um, workflows with our, with our stakeholders. And so we really leveraged that strong team culture as, as well as the techno te technological capacities that we had to really move very quickly to, to a, a much more expanded version of what we were doing. And that's really uh, provided some, some, some good capacity and hopefully some good examples for other agencies to be able to leverage as well. Now, as we, as we sort of ramp down from emergency type measures to quote unquote more normal operations in whatever form you know that that looks like i think what we'll have to figure out is that balance of of you know being accessible uh which which of course we we are now albeit in, in some virtual ways uh you know we want we definitely want to to ramp operations back at our offices have obviously more physical uh, you know uh, spaces for you know for folks to to interact and, and all that you know once once that's uh, safer to do but I think telecommuting will, will definitely be you know more of a of an option I, I think for you know for staff I, I think we've we've proven that it works uh, you know very effectively you know but but of course uh, you know uh, we are local government we're, we're service providers you know I, I don't I don't ever see a situation where you know we're at the very high levels of remote work that we're at today on on an ongoing basis you know we're really doing that in response to the emergency recommendations and and obviously trying to be safe with our staff and with our communities. You know, I, I see definitely, uh, you know, return to the office and but at the same time, quite a bit of telecommuting going on um, and, and striking a, a really good balance of utilizing, you know, that that method because we are efficient and effective in doing that while also making sure that we're fully accessible, you know, as as uh, as available under under hopefully a more opti optimistic scenario in, in the relatively near uh, future. So. I, you know, and I think uh, what we want to do as well, and I know I've mentioned this before in, in past presentations, I think it'll be really interesting and, and hopefully an opportunity for us to share and to, to not only our success in this space, but others that have also been coming up with innovative measures, perhaps creating some forums, you know, where we can be talking to other agencies, large employers, uh, you know, smaller employers, and maybe facilitating some conversations around, you know, what what are the lessons that we can use to to maximize uh let's say from an air quality perspective you know uh maybe reducing some vehicle miles uh, some emissions uh you know increasing efficiencies increase decreasing overhead which I, I believe that you can achieve you know with some of the efficiencies that we've gained and really just uh establishing you know even more best practices when it comes to good governance as we've really been proud to, to promote in the past through our star kind of um work culture sort of sharing efforts and so I, 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 short answer is I think there's going to be a lot of great lessons learned from an efficiency and operational perspective that I think translate to air quality improvement measures. Obviously, you have to balance that with with um, making sure you know that we we still have our team interactions that we need to have, as well as you know all of the um, accessibility that that we you know we we need to be providing to those that we serve and. And I'm confident we'll be able to strike a really good balance, you know, as we sort of emerge, you know, from these pandemic type conditions. Thanks, Mayor. Any further board member questions, comments? Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, public comment. Matt Holmes. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to address this issue. Uh, my comments around COVID, just, you know, to highlight that business as usual is impossible. And pretending to operate like it hasn't changed everything would be to ignore the obvious. You guys have signaled that you totally see that. Um, and so I want to talk about how this relates to the AB 617 process in Stockton, um, you know, which was really unfortunate with timing. They got to have one meeting before the, the pandemic hit us. And so, you know, 617 was a totally new program that, under the best of circumstances, dropped disproportionate burdens on Valley Air and community members. 
Um, CARB is, seems to be coming around to this. I'm really frustrated that they didn't sooner. Um, you know, but the, the, the pandemic has really exacerbated the, the problems of the process. And it's also delivered really competing priorities to community-based organizations who are, you know, helping to deliver vaccines and, and protect people and educate them about the virus, all at the same time that we were trying to work with you guys on this really vital program. Um, you know, I, I wish as soon as it hit that CARB had funded and extended the 617 processes. It would have been the right thing to do. Um, but we can't exactly go backwards. Um, still, I think we, we have an opportunity to extend this process, and I think there are benefits for Valley Air and communities. Um, you know, extending it would give us time uh, to think more so that we, we know that we're, not, that we're making sound decisions and that we're not under the duress of a short timetable. Uh, let's us maximize our funding. I also think for the Air District, who knows what they're doing on this stuff, there are really vital um, emission reduction strategies that our community is refusing to approve just because we haven't had time to explore and understand them. Um, we asked a lot of questions because of the multiple burdens put on planning and staff. Uh, those haven't been answered adequately. And so, you know, we have factually reproved, uh, uh, disapproved those emission reduction strategies that may impact our, our pollution profile long term. So with time, I think we could address those things. Um, you know, the accelerated timetable is already hitting us hard. Uh, the pandemic made it a whole lot worse. And I worry that it's impacting the quality of our plan. I think if we had a little bit more time, we could have a better uh, understanding of how we got here and hopefully approve those vital uh, emission reduction strategies. Uh, the other thing is, you know, CARB has, has failed to release uh, additional funding, the auxiliary community air grants that, you know, other communities have benefited from. Uh, CARB funded two whole separate giant studies in the Richmond San Pablo study area. They also funded four community air grants totaling $1.6 million, uh, giving community air grants the resources that um, to, to monitor their own air. Uh, residents in Stockton want that too, and they haven't had a chance to get it. And they're looking to the air district to provide it, but nobody else had to pay for that out of their community designation. CARB paid for that. We can work together to get that money out of Sacramento with more time. Thank you. Thank you. Manuel Cunha. Can you hear me, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Right, great. Good. Okay, good morning, everybody, and congratulations, uh, Deborah Lewis, as the new board member from the North. Look forward very much um, in working and giving you tours of what agriculture is doing in this valley and across the country. Um, first is I want to thank um, Morgan for his report on the COVID. Uh, just a little bit, Mr. Chairman and board members and Samir, is that agriculture has been working extremely hard on the COVID virus activities, as well as uh, testing, and as well as now heavily working on the vaccine for approximately 230,000 farm workers in this valley. And we've been working very, very, I don't know how else to say it, hard with each of the counties. And we keep going backwards uh, as of even yesterday, for agriculture to worry, to go out and select its workers by age and to have each one of those people go online with the Blue Shield proposal and, and all of that. We can't do that. We cannot have workers. There's no way that agriculture can deal with this issue by having workers go every day to a website and to make an appointment. To do, we're going. You can't track that. You can't even deal with that in our industry. It's not like a business, a Bank of America. So, uh, with all of the elected officials on this board and the board of supervisors, agriculture has to be working in a way that our farmers are able to take all of their workers from their locations and get them treated for the vaccine. If the farm workers now are telling us they want the vaccine, then we need to must we must accommodate that. Sacramento must understand that, and apparently they're not. The governor is not understanding that. And, and this is frustrating because ag wants its workers protected, in our, especially in our rural communities. And these different locations with CBS and Walgreens, those are great. But when it comes to the farmers, we must have the vaccines so that our clinics can implement them and have groups of farmers or farm workers 
they come to those locations or the clinic goes to the farm. But to tell a farmer, tell Miguel to come tomorrow or tell Bob to come tomorrow is not at all feasible. And that causes all the problems for our growers to deal with the issues. Now, what does it relate to the air district? It absolutely does. Because for our farmers to deal with the air district or the growers on various issues, they need to be permitted on and all that. That takes those people. And when those people aren't there, it causes havoc. But I want to thank the air district. I look forward for us all getting back together because communications between the staff and us is very important. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Janet deeds -Kamay. Thank you. I want to thank the district for such a, a remarkable uh, approach to the um, new circumstances that you guys are working under. I think you've done a great job. I want to say, though, I want to reiterate what Dr. Pacheco Warner said. We are at greater risk of becoming sick with COVID-19 due to unclean air. Right now, our problem is PM 2.5. I have reported to district around nine o'clock that on non-burn days, people are burning and there is a lot of smoke in the air. And um, the only time I really got a good uh, response was when I reported someone burning at three in the afternoon. So um, enforcement, 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 enforcement. Uh, and this is another reason why we should ban residential burning or any kind of burning during our atmospheric inversion in the winter months so that we can minimize the amount of pollutants in the air and banning residential burning in Fresno and Bakersfield is not a problem to those of us. And there are many of us, thousands of us who have uh, um, central air central heating, central air conditioning. Residential burning would be extremely helpful in reducing the pollutants that threaten our health normally and add to the threat by making us more vulnerable to COVID-19. And uh, regarding the telecommuting remote work, uh, that is excellent in helping to reduce more mobile source pollutants. My husband's uh, agency is having where they will come in some and work at home some, and that's a great balance. But reducing mobile sources is co accomplished by telecommuting and remote work. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, I see no further public comment on this item. Hey, very good. This is an update item, so no action needed, and we'll move on to the next. Item number 10 is discuss next steps for attainment planning efforts for federal PM 2.5 and ozone standards. Uh, members of the board, just quick introduction. Uh, we're going to have uh, two of our um, excellent uh, members of our management team, Jesse Fierro, assistant counsel, and then John Klassen, uh, director in our planning and science uh, program. Uh, present this item. It's really going to be a, a couple of different parts, uh, uh, starting with uh, talking about the Clean Air Act and our, our mandates and, and, you know, the role that uh, state implementation plans, you know, play in, in uh, addressing Clean Air Act requirements and some of the, the serious ramifications that are, that are associated with, with uh, meeting or not, not meeting those requirements. And then we're going to transition to where we are on our PM 2.5 and our ozone uh, state implementation plans. Those are our two sort of biggest set, sets of issues under the federal um, Clean Air Act requirements, and there are a lot of things that are going on sort of in both areas. So it'll be a little bit of a lengthy presentation. I think it's going to be some good background and reminders on this very important role that the Air District plays under the Clean Air Act, and then some discussion as to where, where we are in terms of next steps moving forward with those state implementation plans. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jesse. been a while. <laughs> Hi, 
everyone, I'm Jesse Fierro. It's really nice to be here to talk to you today about the Clean Air Act as it applies to the work that our agency does and will be doing over the coming years. It is fascinating stuff. I could talk about this for like eight hours, but Samir made me promise not to talk for eight hours. So don't worry. We're going to prioritize it. So you know exactly what the big things are that you need to worry about as board members of our agency. And as complicated as it all is, we can simplify things a little bit right off the bat by just reminding ourselves every step of the way. It is about public health. And for the San Joaquin Valley, there are two air pollutants in particular that we focus on most here because of our natural situation, our natural issues with these pollutants. One of them is PM 2.5. That stands for particulate matter that is 2.5 microns or less in diameter. If you look, well, you can't look at your neighbor's hair, you're too far apart. But if you look at a strand of your own hair, your own hair is about 90 microns in diameter. You could fit like 20 PM 2.5s across your strand of hair. So these are tiny, tiny particles. And it's a wide range of particles. They're made up of all different kinds of stuff. Some of these particles are emitted directly into the air from incomplete combustion. And some of these particles are formed in the air through chemical reactions. So it's very um, complex in terms of how to regulate this and how to reduce levels of PM 2.5, but it's super important to do so because PM 2.5 is associated with a wide range of health impacts, including premature mortality, uh, increased hospital emissions for um, heart and lung issues, uh, bronchitis, asthma attacks, emergency room vis visits, respiratory symptoms, and restricted activity days. So it is, so these health impacts are what motivate EPA under the Clean Air Act to do its regulatory duties. And then that trickles down to us as we reduce PM 2.5 in our region, we are improving public health for our residents. PM 2.5 is our winter and fall issue here in the San Joaquin Valley. In the summertime, our air quality is dominated more by ozone. Ozone is not emitted directly into the atmosphere, so you can't go after that one thing that's emitting ozone. You need to go after those things that are emitting the components of ozone. And those components are called NOx, oxides of nitrogen, and VOCs, volatile organic compounds. When these, com when these materials are released into the air and they encounter sunlight and warm temperatures and dry weather, just like we're accustomed to seeing here in the valley, you get high ozone uh, concentration. So we in the valley experience high ozone during the summer with the peak concentrations in the middle of the day. Again, ozone is associated with health impacts. Ozone most significantly impacts people with asthma, um, it impacts children, older adults, and outdoor workers. And exposure to ozone can cause coughing, throat irritation, pain, burning, discomfort in the chest, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. So it is very important that EPA uh, continue to take close look at looks at these pollutants and that we in the valley keep doing our job to reduce these two very um, important uh, types of pollution for our region. So that's sort of the health foundation for what we're doing. I want to step back a little bit more and talk about the regulatory framework for reducing uh, air pollution. On the federal level, there have been a number of major regulatory acts of Congress that are uh, tackling air pollution. It really started in well, we could go back to the 40s, really. In, in 1948, there was an area called Donora, Pennsylvania that had these five-day smog episodes. Half the town got sick. Meanwhile, you have the 1966 New York Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, you can barely see the floats because the smog is so bad. And in LA, you regularly see people with gas masks because the smog is so bad in LA. So across the country, there is a lot of air pollution concern and a lot of health concerns. It's not just that you can't see the Thanksgiving Parade. You see your hospital emissions go up. President Truman convened the first conference on air quality in 1950. They adopted, Congress adopted an Air Pollution Control Act in 1955, the Clean Air Act in 1963, and the Air Quality Act of 1967. These were pretty much research type acts. They were trying to, to research air pollution problems, start establishing methods for measuring uh, the air pollution problem, and so on. It wasn't really a command and control type approach for the federal government at that point. It's really the Clean Air Act amendments in 1970, where the regulation of air pollution on the federal level started. 1970, there were actually a lot of environmental regulations that were all adopted by Congress within the span of about five years. EPA was formed in 1970. But the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments is when we start putting timelines in place to reduce air pollution. Turns out those timelines were crazy. No one could meet those timelines. And, and, and 
you didn't really know how to make the timelines anyway. So Congress had to go back and amend the act in 1977 and in 1990. The Clean Air Act has not had a major amendment since 1990. So this book on the Clean Air Act, this, this, mine was technically printed in 1994, but it hasn't changed hardly at all in the past 30 years, gosh, time flies when you're having fun. I will tell you there have been about 11 itty bitty little, aren't we having fun? I can tell you're having fun, Supervisor Mendes. Good closing. <laughs> <laughs> time does fly when you're having fun. There have been 11 tiny little amendments to the Clean Air Act by Congress since 1990, but they mostly dealt with definitional things. There hasn't been a large scale amendment to the Clean Air Act since 1990. And we've achieved a lot since 1990 in our region and nationwide to reduce air pollution under the provisions of this Clean Air Act. Before I leave this slide, I do want to note something really important, which is that California actually came to the table to regulate air pollution first. LA County Air Pollution Control District was the first air district in the nation in 1947. California started regulating mobile source emissions in 1966. That's actually tremendously important because California did it first. That's going to have relevance when we talk about mobile source regulation a little bit later in this presentation. Um, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, was, was formed in 1967. It makes sense with all the issues LA was having that we would come to the table first. But with the state regulations and the federal regulations sort of marching forward side by side, it really models this idea of cooperative federalism, this notion that the federal government has a role to play and the states have a role to play when it comes to regulating air pollution. And that, and that cooperative federalism model still exists with the federal government, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They set standards and establish implementation timelines. And I'm going to say the Clean Air Act actually has a lot of other provisions we're not going to talk about today. We're going to focus on achieving better air quality for PM 2.5 and ozone as we're talking today. So EPA will regularly review all kinds of standards and they'll say nationwide, this is the level that will protect public health. States, figure it out. EPA can regulate mobile sources. In fact, they preempt state and local regulations of mobile sources with one notable exception. The idea being Congress didn't want 50 different mobile source regulations. They really wanted a pretty streamlined approach so car manufacturers knew who to look at when they were trying to build cars for the nation. Uh, and the federal government has an oversight function in that they are reviewing and approving our state implementation plans. So at the end of the day, after we adopt the plans that John's going to be talking to you about later, EPA has to agree that those plans meet the Clean Air Act and the implementation rule uh, provisions that stem from that act. So we, we work with EPA continuously and that they, they set the standards and they review our, goal, our plans for reaching those standards. At the, after the federal government does its job, normally the rest of the authority goes to the states. In California, because we're so big, because our air pollution is so complex and um, challenging, we have smaller air districts that also work in conjunction with the states. Some researchers call this cooperative subfederalism. But our state still has a really big role to play in the regulation of uh, uh, air pollution in California. For us, it's called CARB, the California Air Resources Board. Sometimes you hear them called ARB. But the state has oversight of the local air districts like ours. The state can regulate mobile sources if they receive an EPA waiver. Now, didn't I just tell you that Congress didn't want different states regulating mobile sources on their own all willy-nilly? I did, but I also told you that California got there first and adopted the first tailpipe standards in 1966. Because of that, there is a special provision in the Clean Air Act that basically allows California alone is allowed to also establish tailpipe standards, mobile source standards under the Clean Air Act. But each time they do it, California has to go to EPA and say, EPA, we need better tailpipe regulations than the ones you have, so this is what we would like to do. If we demonstrate a need, then EPA has to approve what's called the waiver. So you might hear about the mobile source waiver uh, throughout the presentation today and in the news. It's very important to allow our agency to meet our air quality goals and to avoid sanctions for not meeting those goals. Uh, but it can get pretty complicated. Other states are allowed to adopt California standards. 
So now and then you'll hear people criticize California as trying to have this patchwork of mobile source regulations. Well, A, the Clean Air Act allows us to do it because we got there first, and B, other states have to choose between the federal standards and the state standards. They can't make up their own. And about 14 standards, uh, 14 states do adopt California mobile source standards, and that represents about 40% of the cars sold in the United States. So it's not just us. Some other states use our uh, the California mobile source standards as well. So there's some history. Uh, to that, and we, we want to make sure that California can keep doing that so we can meet our air pollution goals. CARB also regulates uh, area sources and toxic sources. Area sources are things like gas stations and dry cleaners, um, uh, consumer products, they regulate those. And the state approves our SIPs for submission to EPA. So when we write a plan, we work very closely with ARB uh, in developing the modeling and making sure they are regulating the sources under their control. But ultimately, they need to approve what we do as well. So there's a lot of cooperation and oversight built into this regulatory framework. At the local level, for us, that's our agency, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. We regulate stationary and area sources. So we can't go out and create our own mobile source tailpipe emission standards, but we can regulate the stationary sources, the, the, the businesses that are operating in our valley. We have permitting and enforcement, and we are the first step in preparing those SIPs. SIPs, again, stands for State Implementation Plans, and this is where we figure out and tell the world how we're going to meet those health-based standards that are adopted by EPA. So let's talk a little bit more about those standards. We will often hear those called the NAAQS, N-A-A-Q-S, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. EPA sets these. And when they do that, they, they really set NAAQS for only six pollutants. Those are called the criteria pollutants. The ones that affect the valley the most are ozone and particulate matter, and we're non-attainment for both of those. But there are also standards for carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and lead. When EPA sets a NACs, they are not allowed to consider the implementation costs of what, how much would it cost to achieve those NACs. The Supreme Court said you couldn't do that. So EPA only looks at health. These are health-based standards designed to provide a margin of safety to protect the sensitive populations in our communities. And as I mentioned already, in the Valley, the key ones are ozone and particulate matter. EPA is supposed to evaluate these standards every five years through the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee based on the latest health science. For better or worse, it does not happen every five years. <laughs> it just never does uh, because it's a, it's a complicated process. Litigation will sometimes trip us up along the way. Um, sometimes political issues can, can become involved as well. That said, they have been reevaluated a number of times. The first NACs was the one hour ozone NACs in 1979. There was a PM10 NACs in 1987. The NACs we're worried about most now are the PM2.5 NACs and the eight hour ozone NACs. Look at that, there's three for each. 1997, 2006, and 2012 for PM2.5. That's plenty. I'm kind of glad they didn't do every five years. Having three standards to deal with is complicated enough. We're non-attainment for all of those, and there are different planning requirements for each of those. It gets very complicated very quickly. For eight-hour ozone standards, also three standards, 1997, 2008, 2015. We are non-attainment for each of those. Each of those carries its own planning requirements. So we spend a lot of time in our agency tracking those requirements and making sure we're developing documents and regulations that will help us meet all of those standards as quickly as possible to protect public health while also looking at what's technologically feasible. Even though EPA isn't allowed to consider co costs when they set the NACs, state law requires us to consider cost effectiveness and adopting regulations to meet those NACs. So we have a very challenging role here. There are formula-based deadlines in the Clean Air Act. EPA will set an X, they'll look at the entire country and they say, okay, these areas are non-attainment, and then they'll also give you a classification. A classification will determine the deadline and the stringency of the SIP requirements. Um, and those classifications, they, there is some overlap between ozone and PM2.5, but they work a little bit differently because they operate under different portions of the Clean Air Act. For ozone, the, the, mo the highest, the most challenging classification for ozone is extreme. That's us. We are extreme non-attainment for the ozone standards. For PM2.5, the highest classification is serious. 
that's us again. So because of our natural environment, because of the severity of our challenges, we have the highest classifications and the latest deadlines under the Clean Air Act for achieving the next. Well, what happens if we don't meet the next? And what happens if we just decide, oh, we're not going to write a plan today? Well, because of the oversight I mentioned before, there, there would be consequences if we don't meet our obligations under the Clean Air Act. And so some of the things that trigger serious sanctions would be an inability to submit an approvable attainment plan, inability to submit a revised plan in response to EPA disapproval, or a failure to implement the commitments in an EPA-approved plan. Once we adopt, once your board adopts a state implementation plan, our agency needs to implement that plan and adopt all the regulations we attempt, we um, committed to implement. If not, we could face sanctions. The sanctions, uh, there's an 18-month sanction clock, and they include significant barriers to new and expanding uh, businesses. Your permitting offsets are two to one. Very, very difficult to offset any uh, changes to your business with two to one permitting offsets. Also, there's the potential for loss of highway funds. Billions of dollars could be lost to the Valley if we don't meet our Clean Air Act uh, obligations. And also the loss of federal control. If we don't, if EPA determines that we didn't do what we were supposed to do under the Act, the federal government would take over and craft a federal implementation plan or a FIP. And there's a 24 month FIP clock. An EPA would have to adopt or implement measures to address the, um, the deficiencies they identified. EPA can't require our agency to adopt specific regulations or enforce EPA-adopted regulations. But over the years, we haven't been fipped yet, as they say, but uh, we've come close a few times, and draconian measures have been suggested along the way, including no drive days, no farm days, and no construction days. Who knows if we'd get to any of those points, but the threat of a FIP and the loss of highway funds and the permitting sanctions, these these are very serious uh, sanctions, and we take them seriously. And then, of course, there's also the fact that we want to meet the health-based standards. We want to protect our own health and the health of our communities. So sounds easy enough. Just, just adopt a SIP that works. Of course, that is very challenging in an area like ours that have adopted several SIPs over the past several decades, and we've already regulated air pollution quite a bit since 1990. Uh, but for each standard, we stay on top of all the requirements that go with that SIP. Uh, and it really starts with the Clean Air Act, and then it starts from the NACs, the standards that EPA establishes. But EPA will also develop something called an implementation rule. So even though I'll joke around about how the Clean Air Act hasn't been amended since 1990, it's a living act in a lot of ways because EPA will adopt implementation rules that interpret these requirements with respect to the newer standards that they've adopted. Here are the basic components of a SIP. I'm going to talk about these very briefly. You're going to hear more about the specific ways these components are fulfilled from John when he talks about the plans that are upcoming and the plans that have been adopted recently. But the components of a SIP, you have to analyze your air quality data. You'll do this with an official attainment test called a design value. But then you'll also look at your air quality data in a lot of other ways. So there's, we have an extensive monitoring network. We're reviewing our air quality data all the time. We want to know what our air pollution is now, what it's likely to be in the future. Uh, we have an emissions inventory, which is a thorough accounting of all the pollutants that are being emitted into the air. I told you at the beginning of the presentation that nothing emits ozone. You have to track the VOCs and the NOx. For PM 2.5, you have to track all the things that could create PM 2.5. So there, there will be tables and tables and tables in each air quality plan we adopt that presents the uh, current accounting of emissions in our region, as well as how we expect those emissions to grow. I should note, we don't build that inventory alone. We work closely with the state and use uh, approved models and the best information available to craft uh, very uh, defensible emissions inventories. Once we know what our air quality data is and what our emissions inventory is, we have to model future air quality, and we have to try to predict what amount of emissions reductions will get us to our regulatory attainment deadlines. We have to try to get there on time. The model will tell us what percentage we need to reduce our air pollution, so we will also be reviewing control measures. Every plan we do, we leave no stern unturned. We look at all the regulations that have already been adopted, and we ask ourselves, what new, what new technologies are available? What new processes are available? Has it been eight hours yet? I'm almost done. <laughs> We'll look at all the different control measures and we'll have to craft a series of commitments, regulations we can adopt that will help us meet our Clean Air Act deadlines so we don't get sanctioned. 
in the world of ozone. Because the attainment deadlines are pretty far into the future, they're about 20 years away from your attainment designation, there's something called a black box. And what this says is, let's say you need 10 tons of emissions reductions, but you only know how to get about half of it. You put the rest in a black box and you'll say, I'll figure out how to get those emissions reductions later. Now, on the one hand, that sounds a little sketchy, right? Because don't you want to know how you're going to get to your attainment goals? Well, when you have a 20-year attainment horizon, if you've already done everything available now, there are times when you say, okay, well, I everything available is already being implemented and it's not enough. So we're going to fund research. We're going to fund uh, incentive programs. We're going to do whatever we can to come up with the measures that will get us there next. So this is not a static sit back and not do anything type provision. It just gives you an opportunity to buy some time to, to help develop and craft and implement the things that will get you there. We have emissions reductions milestones. You're not allowed to wait till a year before your attainment deadline and then implement everything you need. You have to show gradual progress along the way, which is really important because not only are we marching toward our air quality goals uh, under the Clean Air Act, but we're also improving public health every year as we get closer and closer to EPA's uh, next. We have something called transportation conformity. Many of you sit on the uh, county boards of supervisors and you may work for the city. When we establish an attainment plan and a mobile source emissions inventory, the eight county metropolitan planning organizations then have to show that anything they do, any road expansion, any bridge they built, that they are, are conforming with the SIP, that the things that they are implementing uh, don't make it more difficult for us to reach attainment. So we actually coordinate pretty closely with the county MPOs to make sure that they have transportation conformity budgets they can use and that they stay consistent with those conformity budgets. All, everything I've talked about so far is directly related to improving air quality on a continual basis, but the last thing on the list here is contingency measures. Contingency measures are backup emissions reductions that you identify and you adopt but you do not implement. You only use those contingency measures if it turns out that you didn't reach your attainment goals on time. That is extremely challenging. The contingency measures, when you put them in a plan, they have no immediate benefit to air quality because by definition, under something called the bar case, you're not supposed to implement those emissions reductions until you need them. Now, wait a second. I told you a little while ago that the San Joaquin Valley has some of the most challenging air quality in the nation. If we had an idea to improve air pollution, shouldn't we just do it? Why would we hold it in reserve? And that is one of the big difficulties with this idea of contingency measures. The notion of knowing how to improve air quality but not doing it is crazy. And yet the Clean Air Act requires you to have contingency reductions, approved measures that you're not implementing that have no benefit to air quality right now. This is one of the most challenging, legally, it's one of the most challenging components of a state implementation plan. And it's something that we are tracking uh, very closely and we've been involved with, in litigation on this particular facet of the plan. But I just want to acknowledge that even though contingency measures are a small number of pages, when you get these 700 page documents and there's maybe four pages of contingency measures, it might not feel like a big deal, but it's one of the most uh, challenging components of the plan. Once we submit a plan to EPA, they have 18 months to act on it. I told you earlier that EPA has some oversight functions involved in this cooperative federalism Clean Air Act scheme. Uh, once EPA approves our SIP, then it becomes federally enforceable. So anyone who felt that we weren't implementing our SIP would be able to take action in federal court. Now, those are the components of a SIP. And even though it's complicated, it sounds, you know, it's not too bad. But then you remember, wait a minute. I have three ozone standards and I have three PM 2.5 standards. So I think when Congress crafted the Clean Air Act uh, of 1990, they, they had this really elegant process in mind where, oh, we're going to set a standard and then we'll identify non-attainment areas, they'll write a plan, they'll reduce emissions, and everything will be great. But you, we have six different standards we're not attainment for, so the reality of the Clean Air Act SIP cycle is, is all over the place. It, it, it is not as linear. <laughs> It is not linear or straightforward at all. It gets pretty challenging. Um, but 
you know, rest assured that our staff is constantly looking for ways to keep it as streamlined and as accessible as possible by working with the public and giving you all updates on how this all works. So that is the foundational Clean Air Act regulatory uh, portion of this. At this point, uh, I'm going to turn things over to John Class and the Director of Air Quality Science and Planning to tell you how our agency has uh, implemented the Clean Air Act over the past few years and will in the next couple years. John, did you drink the same coffee that Jesse drank? It's <laughs> I had some coffee, but probably not the same. Expectations are high now. I want to. I know. I don't want to disappoint you guys. All right. Well, good morning, members of the board. John Klassen, Director of Air Quality Science and Planning. So I'm going to give you an, an update of where we are in implementing our latest PM 2.5 plan and then some background on ozone planning and what we are going to be putting together for the next the next ozone plan. So just a bit of background here. Um, as we know, we have a lot of challenges that we're faced with uh, with air quality in the valley. We really have an unmatched combination of topography and meteorology. We have mountain ranges to the east of us, to the west of us, to the south of us. We have meteorology that can often place a lid over the bowl of the valley during the winter and the summer that can easily trap those emissions and things can build up quickly in those conditions. We also have a number of uh, other issues facing us, major goods movement corridors throughout the valley, high population growth throughout the region, and pollution transport from other areas, and wildfires, of course, each, each year that can really significantly impact our air quality throughout the valley. We also have 20 of the 30 most disadvantaged California communities located within the San Joaquin Valley. So lots of issues that we're faced with and challenges in improving air quality. But over time, uh, your board has adopted numerous attainment plans and strategies to address the federal standards that, that Jesse was talking about. Uh, we've adopted nearly 650 stringent rules and regulations. Emissions from stationary sources have been re reduced by over 90%. In addition to that, CARB has also adopted a number of mobile source emissions control regulations and strategies to take that take care of that part of the, the emissions mix here in the Valley. Uh, the combination of us and CARB together, the district and CARB, our combined efforts really represent the nation's toughest emissions control program. On top of that, we have a strong incentive program. As you know about, we've now invested over $3.5 billion in both public and private funding to reduce emissions there. And through all these investments, uh, we continue to make major improvements with respect to air quality across the valley. And you probably have seen this before. It's here in our boardrooms. Um, lo looking at the, the change in NOx emissions over time, we've, we've of course seen a significant change here, um, going from the, the year 1980 in the past to the year 2020. And NOx is a really key uh, uh, um, pollutant for both reductions in ozone and PM 2.5, since NOx is a key precursor to the formation of both of those key pollutants. So. Getting NOx reductions is really key for us, so looking at this progress here is, is great to see and we're uh, looking forward to continuing to make progress here to, to see these reductions. And all the work that we've been doing here, uh, all these strategies have been building upon one another. This is a list of all of the plans that, that uh, the district has put together over the years and all these strategies continue to build and, and get better and better over time. Going back to 2003 with our PM10 plan, our first ozone plan in 2007 for the 1997 eight hour ozone standard. Our first PM 2.5 plan in 2008 for the 1997 PM 2.5 standard, followed in 2012 with our next PM 2.5 plan for the 2006 standard. A 2013 ozone plan for the one hour ozone standard. Uh, our 2016 ozone plan for the 2008 eight hour ozone standard. And then a 2016 moderate area plan for the 2012 PM 2.5 standard. And then finally, our latest plan, our 2018 plan that we've talked a lot about with your board for the 97, 2006, and 2012 standard. So obviously, as Jesse was mentioning, a lot of different plans are in play here in the Valley. We're working through all the requirements, tracking air quality, making sure that we're meeting all the, all the necessary components for all of these plans that we've put together. So switching now, just a bit of background on our, on our 2018 PM 2.5 plan and the progress we're making there. Your board adopted this plan in, in November of 2018 to address the latest standards for PM 2.5. This included a lot of different strategies from regulatory measures, incentive-based measures, the mobile source strategy, a hotspot strategy, public outreach and education, technology advancement, and a call for action by state and federal governments to do their part to reduce emissions along with what we do here locally. This was developed through an extensive public process 
and both CARB and the district here, we're actively implementing the plan commitments to reduce emissions to meet these standards. It's just an update here on, on where we are with this. We've already made significant progress in implementing the strategy for this plan. Your board has taken recent action on a number of things, just listing them here. We've launched new incentive programs for alternatives to open ag burning, low dust nut harvesters, commercial zero emission lawn and garden. Uh, we've also uh, are continuing to implement a wide ranging in, uh, range of incentive programs as replacement of trucks, ag equipment, wood burning devices. Um, we've adopted our uh, enhanced residential wood smoke reduction strategy. Just uh, at the end of last year, we've adopted amendments to rule 4311 concerning flares and rules 4306, 4320 concerning boilers, steam generators, and process heaters, and adopted our under fire char broiler emission reduction strategy and have adopted additional agricultural burning prohibitions. What's coming up uh, this year in 2021, the progress that we're planning to continue to make to meet the commitments from the 2018 PM 2.5 plan include Rule 4702 concerning internal combustion engines, Rule 4354 glass melting furnaces, and Rule 4352 solid fuel fired boilers, steam generators, and process heaters. And uh, we'll be coming to your board with updates on emissions reductions achieved through our burn cleaner program and our ag plant replacement incentive program. And we'll continue to do work on implementing um, our key SIP creditable incentive programs like heavy duty vehicle and equipment replacement programs, wood burning device change out, change out low dust nut harvesters and alternatives to open uh, to ag open burning. CARB is also making a lot of progress in implementing their mobile source measures from our PM 2.5 plan. Um, and given the need for additional and significant additional emissions reductions for mobile sources by the 2024-2025 timeframe, uh, which are the attainment deadlines for, um, for the PM 2.5 standards, uh, we continue to advocate for the fair share emissions reductions from state and federal governments um, and the funding that we need for that. And as you heard at our board meeting just last month, the preliminary state budget does include for now significant to assist with these, uh, these programs to get these uh, mobile, source, mobile source emissions reductions that we need. Um, from the state SIP, SIP strategy specifically, last year CARB took action in June 2020 on the advanced clean trucks rule requir requiring the phase in of zero emissions trucks and a couple months later in August of 2020, they took action on the omni omnibus rule establishing low NOx requirements for heavy duty trucks and, and additional requirements um, for that type of equipment. Uh, CARB will continue to work on their on implementing the, the measures within the PM 2.5 plan over this next year in 2021. And a key part of that is at the end of this year in 2021, they're anticipating taking to their board the statewide heavy duty truck inspection and maintenance program. And it really is critical that the state mobile source strategy address uh, the Valley's near term public health and attainment needs as new longer term state goals are established by, by CARB. Just the timeline of where we are with the EPA's review of the 2018 PM 2.5 plan. As I mentioned in November of 2018, your board adopted, adopted this plan. In January 2019, a couple of months later, CARB approves the 2018 PM 2.5 plan. Then later that spring, CARB submits the plan formally to EPA for their review. And in June of last year, June 2020, EPA uh, officially approved the SIP for the 2006 PM 2.5 standard. And from that point to where we are now, EPA is in process of reviewing the portions of the 2018 plan concerning the 1997 and 2012 PM 2.5 standards. And uh, both us and CARB are continuing to support EPA as they continue to review the plan for those standards. So that's an update for where we are with the 2018 PM 2.5 plan. Let me shift now to, to ozone and, and talk a few minutes about where we are with, with ozone planning. As Jesse mentioned, ozone, uh, really is a summertime issue here for the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, this is really driven by NOx, uh, NOx emissions from combustion-related combustion equipment. With the meteorology we can have, those NOx emissions can be trapped on the valley floor. Um, and in combination with VOC and sunlight, we can get the formation of ozone during those conditions during the summer. And your board has already shown commitment to reduce ozone across the valley through approving a number of, uh, of ozone plans already. We mentioned the 2013 ozone plan, which, which was targeted to, to, re, to reduce emissions to meet the one hour ozone standard. And we do now meet that standard, which is a great accomplishment. The 2007 ozone plan that your board adopted, this included a black box of unidentified measures and the Valley is on track to, to, to meet that, this deadline by 2023. And I'll say a bit more about that in a, in a slide or two. 
And the, the latest plan was the 2016 ozone plan, uh, which was for the, the, um, the standard of 75 parts per billion, and we are on track to meet that by the 2031 deadline. We did want to point out here, too, uh, about the progress that we've made with ozone in the valley is that, is that the San Joaquin Valley is the first and only region in the nation to be classified as extreme non-attainment. That's what Jesse was talking about. We were classified as extreme, and we've now uh, reached attainment of that standard. We are the only region to ever, to, ever to do that, so that's a great, great accomplishment for the area. Looking at the, the, um, the results of all the ozone planning and emissions reductions that we've, we've been able to achieve over the years, uh, this really has led to a number of improvements. Um, looking specifically at the number of days that we've exceeded the different federal ozone standards, looking at, uh, through the year 2020, we've seen our days over the 84 parts per billion standard decrease by over 90%, over a 70% reduction in days over the 75 parts per billion standard, and over a 35% reduction in days over the 70 parts per billion standard. And spe specifically looking at population exposure to these different peak ozone levels, we've seen an over 90% reduction in population exposure uh, to these high ozone levels that can happen during the summertime. Did want to point out here, too, that in 2020, through the year 2020, we experienced another record low, what's called the design value, um, for eight-hour ozone. And, and looking at the progress that we've made so far, we now are 91% of the way where we need to go to meet that 84 parts per billion standard by that first deadline of 2023. And showing this on a chart here, it might be a little easier to see where we're looking at the trend here of our eight hour ozone design value. Looking back in time, in the early 90s on the left hand side, we were at almost 120 parts per billion. As we go forward to the right towards the year 2020, you can see a gradual decrease here, which is great to see. We have a number of, of lines there below showing the different different standards that we're working towards. That, that first uh, line, that orange dashed line, that's the first st standard we need to meet set at 84 parts per billion. The deadline for that is 2023. You can see that we're very close to that. We're at about 87 parts per billion right now. That's only three parts per billion away from hitting that first goal. So we're almost there. It's looking good. And you can see the progress we still need to make to get to that uh, 75 parts per billion standard and the 70 parts per billion standard. Those deadlines are 2031 and 2037 respectively. So we're almost there to that first finish line and then we need to continue to make progress for those next couple of standards. And specifically about the 84 parts per billion standard, in fact, in 2019, CARP took action to approve uh, a progress report on the Valley's implementation of that 2007 ozone plan that was concerning that 84 parts per billion standard. And CARB, uh, in their report, they affirmed the tremendous progress that the Valley has made towards meeting the standard. They've affirmed that the Valley is on track to, to reach attainment by 2023 in that black box that Jesse talked about. This plan did have a black box where we needed to get further emissions reductions that weren't yet identified. Through this CARB report, they concluded that those, em those emission reductions have been identified, they're being achieved, and that we are on track to meet that standard by 2023. And this CARB action that uh, was submitted to EPA as a revision to the Valley's attainment plan. So with that background, a little bit of detail now on the latest ozone plan that we are starting to put together. So EPA established a, a new ozone standard in 2015. Um, and as Jesse talked about, EPA goes through a, a process approximately every five years to, address, to, to, look at, to look at the standards to see if any changes need to be made. They made this change in 2015 where it was lowered from 75 parts per billion to 70 parts per billion. Um, through this action, we were designated as extreme non-attainment in 2018. So that set a timeline for us to put together the attainment plan for this by 2022, which we're working towards with an attainment deadline of 2037. So with this new ozone plan we're starting to work on, which we call the 2022 ozone plan, even though we've made significant progress, which we've described here in it, reducing emissions, improving ozone across the valley, we still need substantial further reductions in NOx emissions to attain this new 2015 federal eight-hour ozone standard. And since over 85% of the re remaining NOx emissions in the valley do come from mobile sources that are under state and federal jurisdiction, it really is important that we continue our efforts to reduce emissions from passenger vehicles, heavy-duty trucks, locomotives, and other mobile sources and all these must be pursued to be able to, to meet this new standard. This new plan we're working on will continue to build on existing air quality strategies that we listed before. All those plans that we've been that we've been working on that have already been implemented, this next plan will build off of all of that and continue to get emissions reductions, which will uh, certainly help towards, um, towards meeting both of our ozone and PM 2.5 goals. 
uh, some detail here on the on the the process over the next couple of years. Um, last year in 2020, we've already taken some action to address the federal standards. We brought before your board the RAC demonstration, the emission statement program certification, CARB updated the emissions inventory for the base year. Looking at this year in 2021, some of the tasks that will be accomplished is um, the emissions inventory will be finalized by CARB, but we'll project the future year inventories based on what we expect with different, different industries, modeling and air quality analysis, reasonable available control uh, measures, rule analysis, attainment strategy development, and the review of our new source review rule. Then going into the year 2020, by the middle of 2022, uh, we're planning to bring this attainment plan to your board for consideration. And then the plan needs to be submitted to, to EPA by August of 2022, which will then set that attainment deadline of 2037 to meet this new standard. So I've already mentioned some of this here. I, I won't say it again, but we've already taken some steps to address the federal requirements for, um, from the RAC demonstration and the emission statement program certification. All the other steps that we'll be taking here in the coming year are related to looking at the emissions inventory, um, going through a, the RACM demonstration, modeling, until we finally can put together our attainment plan and our strategy to, to address uh, all the federal standards. So to wrap up, we just wanted to, to highlight here um, the guiding principles that we are planning to utilize for this 2022 ozone plan development. And this is consistent with previous guiding principles that we've used for other attainment plans. And these principles are uh, with public health as our number one priority, provide for expeditious attainment of federal health-based health -based air quality standards across the San Joaquin Valley communities. Use sound science as the plan's foundation, including efforts to assess public health impacts, predict future air quality, determine ex the extent of emissions reductions needed, and evaluate availability, effectiveness, and feasibility of emission control measures. Consider the Valley's unique challenges and develop cost-effective strategies that provide adequate operational flexibility and minimize cost to Valley businesses. Consider all opportunities for timely, innovative, and cost-effective emission reductions. Consider traditional regulations, but look beyond traditional regulations to incorporate clean air incentives, policy initiatives, guidance documents, and outreach. Given that over 85% of the Valley's NOx emissions originate from mobile sources, provide a balanced approach to reducing mobile and stationary source emissions. Devise and implement reasonable strategies that involve the public in reducing emissions. Prioritize strategies that contri contribute to attainment uh, of multiple air quality standards. Recognize that there is no silver bullet for attainment. Every sector from public through all levels of government, businesses, and industry must continue to reduce emissions. Pursue adequate resources and regulatory assistance from state and federal agencies to reduce emissions from sources other under their jurisdiction. Pursue zero and near zero emissions technology demonstration efforts to assist the Valley to meet the health-based air quality standards as expeditiously as possible. Evaluate and address as feasible air pollutant transport impacting the Valley. And the last principle here is provide ample opportunity for public participation and feedback in design and implementation of plans, utilize planning process to also inform participants of the Valley's air quality challenges and successes as well as actions that can be taken to improve the Valley's air quality. So finally, just next steps here for this, uh, for this ozone plan. We will, we will of course go through a, a robust public engagement process and this is critical for the development of this plan. Um, upon completion of our analysis of the existing regulatory programs and the statewide mobile source measures, uh, District and CARB will recommend additional control measures as needed to achieve the standard expeditiously. We will establish stakeholder engagement opportunities to discuss the key areas of interest, solicit input from affected sources, community-based organizations, residents, and stakeholders, and we'll continue to provide updates at public workshops and meetings, including meetings of your governing board, the CAC, and EJAG. And as we did during the public engagement process with the measures that we adopted in 2020, we will be sure to conduct virtual workshops and meetings to provide a uh, to promote participation um, even during the pandemic here. We'll make sure that everybody can stay involved. And as Morgan discussed earlier, regarding COVID-19 economic impacts, we'll definitely be mindful of that and closely follow what's happening with the, the Valley's economy as we put together a strategy for the plan to attain this, this standard. And as I mentioned, we expect to bring this attainment plan back to your board for a public hearing by the middle of 2022. 
And uh, regarding the 2018 PM 2.5 plan, we will also continue to provide you updates um, as we continue to, to make progress in implementing our measures and as CARB implements their measures. And that's it for our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Very good, uh, Jesse and John, thank you. And, and to our new board members, man, this uh, presentation is a keeper. One that uh, if you're uh, you know, a new board member and, and you want to understand the challenges of, of uh, you know, how we're going to get to uh, meeting the standards, uh, this document I would print and save and refer on a regular basis. So, um, John and Jesse, thank you so much for this presentation. Still need to figure out what coffee that was. So every time I read it, I can uh, drink a cup before I read it. And <laughs> Okay, questions, uh, Supervisor, or excuse me, Mayor Bessinger. Just real quickly, when we, um, when we put things in this black box, we also need to speak to the areas that we have no control over that, uh, that cause us not to be in attainment and quantify those so that when, if we get to the point in some future situation where EPA wants to implement draconian measures that we can point out that if they'd had a forest management plan, if maybe we had done um, job um, education for fellers and loggers, we wouldn't have had all these fires and that would have been worth X amount of pollutants. So that when, when, we, when we do offsets with people, this is our own offset. If you had done this, we wouldn't have had this problem. We would have been in attainment. Uh, so we, they can't, I, I would love to see, well, I don't want to see it, but uh, a no drive, no farm day, good luck. Um, that, will, that, that will never happen. So when I, when I see that threat, it's just a hollow threat, and I, and I dismiss that immediately. But I think we need to have in our quiver their failures as an agency uh, so that they can't blame us for non-attainment. Thank you. Supervisor Wheeler. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Man, what a presentation. You know, this is the stuff that I, I don't know how many years I've been on this, but this is a good summary I've ever heard. And when we go to Washington, D.C., uh, when we get done here with the board members, I'd like Samir to talk about you know, going there, a bunch of us has been there, and including you, Chairman, uh, and trying to talk uh, Congress into updating the 20, I mean, the 1990 uh, Act, you know, and you talk about getting just almost uh, snubbed out because they do not want to open that box for some reason. We need it open so bad, like like uh, our presenters said, and thank you, John and Jesse, what a job. Plain, concise, and I could understand it, even you know, remotely like this. Uh, when we try to explain that to Congress up there, they don't get it. I, if, if we could get every one of our Congress people up there to read this, what they presented today, I think they would open their eyes and open up what we got. When you got six different plans, that just overlap the other ones. It's just about the craziest thing you could ever have. So thank you staff and thank you board members and new board members. This is as good as you'll ever get. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shares. Thank you. Uh, Yes, my I hat hat off to the staff for putting this together, helping uh, make sense of such a complicated subject. And this is a presentation well worth uh, keeping and being able to refer to. Uh, one question I have for staff is I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, the commitment to public engagement, because I think that is so important. Uh, there are lots of good ideas out there. Um, it's also critical in terms of uh, public trust about what we do and building public support for uh, the, the challenging uh, 
things we have to put forward to achieve these health and scientific based standards. Uh, if, if public engagement is mid 2022, uh, that, that's, that's, that's too late. Uh, and I know you've outlined in the, in the, in the, in the report, uh, public engagement well before that, but, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about how, how we're going to do that so that, um, the public has an opportunity to help us with this and, uh, also to, to have that sense of inclusion. Mr. Thank Chair, you. I could provide a quick response and hopefully answers uh, Dr. Sheriff's uh, question. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the board has always uh, gone above and beyond on, on public engagement. Min minim there's pretty minimal requirements actually for ultimately uh, submitting a plan like this, but your board has always made that a guiding principle. And uh, uh, we've always tried to come up with some pretty innovative ways to get folks involved in, in the uh, process. And we're really gonna be leaning on that experience along with some of the more recent experiences that we've had in, in coming up with even newer public engagement opportunities through AB 617, some of the regulatory development this last year. So, and it's really multifaceted, it, it, it's, it, it's at all levels. There, there are going to be um, opportunities for meeting with uh, individual um, organizations, members of the public, which, which are really important. I'm just gonna start at more at the grassroots level and, that, and that's always been a great place to engage on, on specific issues of interest, you know, where, where sometimes some of the broader meetings get, you know, don't necessarily drill down on, on specific issues that folks may want to talk about. So those are going to be happening, you know, throughout this whole process as we, you know, engage and hear from folks that, that have, you know, any, any specific areas that they want to talk about. Then of course, there's going to be, um, workshops along the way, you know, scoping meetings to talk about, you know, some of the same things that we cover today, but as those elements that John uh, had explained and Jesse as well are unfolding, you know, there, there are going to be opportunities kind of along the way to provide updates on where those are, take public feedback and comment and continue making uh, enhancements and, and consideration of that feedback along the way. And then I think, you know, there, there's been other um, uh, uh, models that we've used in the past that I, th I think are, you know, are worthy of uh, consideration in this process that we have inten intention to, um, to uh, uh, implement. There are some very important subject matter uh, areas here you know, um, that have very important roles within the air quality planning process. For example, the mobile source measures and, and how those measures, you know, when, when you look at what CARB is doing and planning to do in the coming year and beyond, you know, how, how do we do deeper dives into, into those measures, the stationary measures? You know, I think if there's opportunities for, for having, you know, some, some uh, meetings that are a little bit more focused on some of those really important categories of issues, you know, we're, we're looking at that as well. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe having kind of work group type concepts, you know, around specific issues. So those are all there's going to be a number of meetings and opportunities and, and we're always, you know, we're all ears when we hear from somebody if they have an idea of how we could, you know, participate, you know, maybe it's a, a standing meeting of, of some organization where we can provide updates and run, you know, um, ideas, you know, by, by folks. So we're always looking for those opportunities and it, it's, you know, our, our board here and the staff, are, you know, are no strangers to, to good public engagement on these uh, plans and we always go above and beyond, you know, what um, any, any other agency does in, in this area. Thank you. Supervisor Keza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, what a great presentation. And I hope that all the new board members feel as overwhelmed as I do at this <laughs> exam. And because this is a very complicated. But I want to take a step back and thank Samir because he always sets time ahead of these meetings to um, prep me and answer some of my silly questions. Uh, I know that they're setting aside some time uh, for the new board members for orientation, and this would be a great, a great first step here so we can get a deeper dive without asking 500 questions right now. Uh, but again, I, I, I understand the significance uh, now, and I was warned by Supervisor Olson ahead of time uh, of how difficult this is. And Tom, you can sit and laugh at me all day long, but <laughs> what I don't know. You understand. You understand. So, but again, thank you to Samir and thank you to the, I think it was the chair who had suggested the orientations and I look forward to those. 
Thank you. Supervisor Mendes. Yeah, it was, you know, very in-depth explanation of a very confused issue, you know, and uh, you guys, I mean, you guys live it so you know it forwards and backwards, no matter how complicated it is, which is really refreshing. Um, you know, we, we did, I think, uh, Samir, was it 17? I know Tom was talking about going back in D.C. We actually got a bill out of the House that year, but it kind of died in the Senate. And, uh, yeah. Tom, you always got to remember rule number one, <laughs> especially in, in Washington, D.C. It's very... Uh, Big, it's stupid. very common. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, it, this, this is an issue that actually I, I, I totally I'm, I'm happy that the chair has suggested you do more orientation on this because, you know, the board itself needs to understand this in depth and not, you know, just a surface dive at it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pacheco Warner. Hi, everyone. Um, I thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a, a question, and um, I but I but I first want to reiterate um, Dr. Sheriff's comments about um, public engagement, and I know that you know while non-traditional, um, your increased use of of social media in the district, I think, could also be a, as an added tool um, for engagement on this issue. Um, but um, on slide 27, um, in terms of talking a little bit about the guiding principles, <clears throat> you talk about including efforts to assess public health impacts. And I was just wondering if you have any kind of initial <coughs> thoughts of how you're, you're doing that or just um, anything more that you could provide on that aspect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I could provide a brief response on that, uh, Samir, here. Um, yeah, so in, in the past, uh, Dr. Pacheco Warner, uh, we've tried to use a variety of tools to, to really highlight the uh, not only the importance of the uh, the plan and, and the reductions in achieving the, the public health benefits, but also actually trying to quantify in, in various ways, you know, what could be achieved or what would be achieved, you know, through, uh, say, meeting attainment in this case of, of the federal standard. There, there's some models that are that are available for that, and um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that you've probably seen some of the literature in the past, some studies that have been done that uh, try to uh, provide estimates of uh, per perhaps some of the uh, the various health-related uh, benefits. You know, some of the uh, um, the endpoints that you're you're looking for on a variety of fronts. Uh, you know, related to uh, whether it's premature, you know, mortality. Uh, you know, uh, reduced or, uh, you know, maybe some of the ER, you know, there's a variety of various health uh, kind of related, you know, endpoints that, that I think you can, we can try to at least quantify. It's, it's a very difficult exercise. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy thing to do and it's not required to be done under the various uh, requirements that are associated with these plans. But I think to try to address the questions, uh, you know, from, from the board and the public as we sort of go through this process, you know, we have tried to do to do work in that area, and I think it's something that we'll def definitely be looking at as we go through the plan development process to, to make it you know some supporting you know information. I think as we uh, develop the plan, and I'm happy to share more information with you. Uh, you know, uh, trying to keep it a relatively high level there, but it, I can point you to some some of the work that's been done in the past to, to look at that. Thank you, Thank and you. I know that CARB will be taking up a a, a study um, funding a study. So maybe we can leverage some of what they're already funding to do to help inform our estimates as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Preciado. Yes, good morning, everyone. Just want to call in and uh, thank staff for a very uh, concise and uh, report, a lot of history. And uh, I also want to say that I uh, want to thank uh, Samir for his office being open to comments and uh, reaching out, out to us uh, rural disadvantaged communities. Every time I had an idea, or I will especially like the yearly report for 19, 2019 and 2020, 
I was able to get some copies in Spanish that I distributed. And that's something we need to do to expose the district for all the work they have done in the past. And I'm really proud to be a member. Being, I would like to recognize uh, the every district for being number one in the nation, implementing and reducing uh, pollutants that harm our community members. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. Matt Holmes. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, amazing presentation, both the history and the planning. Um, I feel like I should pay for continuing education units. I uh, love the history of the Clean Air Act. Uh, they both highlight massive challenge, and frankly, I agree, we only have so much control over it. Um, but first, I feel like I need to address some comments that I heard that seem to buck at coming into attainment. You know, we shouldn't be trying to lower the bar. We should be working to come into attainment. Um, those comments seem to dismiss the health impacts that the elevated pollution delivers. That's a real people body, you know, it's not just regulatory overreach. It certainly is some of that. Um, but, you know, there, there are some things to do on a certain timetable, like addressing the lingering ag burning issue, which we really just have to escalate and add a sense of urgency to it. There's no way around that one. Um, but I also wanted to share some opportunities to the 617 communities to pilot innovative strategies that CAR will have to look at and, and, and take more seriously. Um, frankly, the emission reduction plans we're seeing are pretty heavy on existing programs and funding buy and bolt replacement strategies, which, you know, we already see are funded under Moyer. So there's a way that we can weave those two things together. Um, under 617, we can try things that you all can't. They aren't perfect, but um, they should be explored for public health and economic benefit. Um, but the main point I wanted to make is, yeah, I agree, our attainment isn't entirely our cause. I know that major sources of PM 2.5 and ozone are coming in from the Bay Area. Uh, those those contribute to non attainment You know, it's not forests and fires. I'm sorry, it isn't. It's industry and vehicle activity. Um, we need to hold them accountable for flushing their air into our region. That has to be taken into account when we inevitably inevitably end up under a fit. Um, we can do things to help make that argument by integrating the type of work you're already doing that are in silos. Uh, things like community complaints and monitoring don't appear to be correlated at any level. Um, we can do that so a reporter's efforts are validated and the monitoring is substantiated um, and so that enforcement can become more targeted. That's something that we can control. Um, certainly with those things integrated, um, you know, we can, we can integrate them with new modeling platforms. There's new sophisticated platforms that can attribute a regional uh, pollution that we know about and then we can draw a big red circle around the huge unattributed pollution that is almost always following the river into our region from the bay. Um, that's something we can help you do. And then finally, you know, this is a huge challenge and I, I think we're all, we're all up the creek on trying to come into attainment. I think it's only gonna be exacerbated when I think this new EPA uh, picks up the Government Accountability Office recommendations to revise and narrow the NAC. Um, they've made a really clear recommendation on that. Um, when that happens, we'll be even further in a hole I hope folks here planning have the GAO NACS revision on their radar and that those are taken into consideration when these new plans evolve. Uh, thank you for really awesome education. Thank you. Janet Dietz Kamei. Thank you. Um, from an asthmatic point of view, from the point of view of those of us who have respiratory problems, need clean air, period. We need clean air and we aren't there yet. Ozone causes me to have an asthma attack. Now, what happens when you have an asthma attack? Imagine putting a plastic bag over your head, holding it tight. How much air can you inhale with a plastic bag on your head. And that is what an asthma attack is like. You cannot get air in. PM 2.5 causes me to have sinusitis, bronchitis, and pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is not a good place to be. Again, 
you cannot read. So I spend much of the year inside of my house or inside of my car with an air purifier inside of the car and being dropped off immediately outside of a, of a store so I can pop in without being affected by the air. It is not a, a, a cheap to have asthma. There are medications, there's MERV-14, HVAC filters, there's air purifiers, and the HEPA filters you have to get for those. It's not cheap if you end up in the emergency room. We need to pursue cleaning the air with no any, uh, anything else in mind, just making the air breathable for the thousands of us with asthma. <clears throat> now, because we are going to be having uh, wildfires because of climate change, we need to reduce PM 2.5 fast. It was recommended I move to the coast. Now, maybe we can have a program where we can move all of the asthmatics to the coast where the air is good. Is that something we want to pursue? Moving all of the asthmatics and those with respiratory diseases to the coast? Is that the answer? Or is the answer, let's clean the air? Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Helm. Uh, hi. Um, uh, just a couple things. Uh, again, I'll agree with everybody that that was a, a great uh, presentation <coughs> and very uh, succinctly uh, done. So much appreciated. Um, I did want to clarify a couple of things, kind of questions and comments. Um, the statement about the multiple attainment plans um, for the different years, I've, I've heard that before at meetings and I've, I've brought it up to kind of clarify, um, you know, there's the different years and I don't have them in front of me, like 1995, 2012 that were mentioned um, and how the, the kind of burden that comes with trying to reach the different plans. And it's, it's my understanding that I know that there might be requirements um, uh, for showing how uh, you came into attainment, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, if you're focusing on the most recent plan and reaching the attainment for that, you will be reaching attainment for the older plans. Um, like I said, there might be uh, still the, the reporting that has to be done that addresses the specific plan, but if you're, you're focusing on the most recent and you reach attainment in that, you would be in attainment for the old ones. And like I said, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. Um, the other thing I've, I've heard before and I've tried to get clarification about the contingency measures that, that are hard to come up with, that are things that, that are kind of, you know, left aside, uh, uh, but that aren't part of the plan. Um, and I've heard things that, that could be in that category that aren't uh, presently being used like a no drive day and I know that does sound um, completely unrealistic so is that is that something keeping from something like that being a contingency plan um, is, is that the kind of thing that you would include in that or or maybe something not um, as extreme but you know like uh, this I'm just going off the top of my head like banning drive throughs for example or something like that would that be something that could be a contingency plan that's not being put into effect but that is um, left in that. So somebody can kind of clarify that. And just uh, really quickly, the other thing I, I heard mentioned about making a point of the things we can't control in the Valley or that the Air District can't control. And it was mentioned about wildfires and that, you know, it's, it's not the Valley that regulates how the forests are managed. But, it, and correct me if I'm wrong again, but um, the wildfires aren't taken into account with our, our air data because um, that's an extreme event and it um, doesn't count against um, uh, the, the data. And I even think I saw that on one of the charts. It said 2020 does not include wildfire um, data. So I, I, I think that there are other things, though, that, that are under the prerogative of the state, like electric vehicles and fighting climate change. Um, that do fall under that category, and I'd like to see uh, advocated for um, 
uh, as part of the Air District. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there, there's quite a few great questions by Thomas there. I'm, I'm happy to circle back with him to just in the interest of time to try to address those. But um, I thought he raised a number of good points and uh, excited hopefully to have him also participate in the <laughs> the public engagement process where I think a lot of those questions are going to be you know discussed and a lot of feedback I'm sure provided so um, yeah there really aren't easy answers to, to most of what was raised I think but they were just good questions to be raised so we'll I'll circle back with them and okay Dr. Sheriffs. Uh thank you and I I, I just wanted to highlight uh the tone of collaboration in this report, which I think is so important. And I was reminded of this from Matt's comments about issues of bad air from the Bay Area. But in fact, this report emphasizes not finger pointing and saying not our responsibility, but how do we work together? Uh, how do we get out of our silos? How do we look for the commonalities uh, to achieve these scientific, scientifically determined health-related goals. Um, you know, it's, it's looking, I, I like this report because I believe it points us in the direction of highlights, collaboration with EPA on working for better mileage and emission standards, for working to support CARB's waiver authority, because that's how we can have a positive impact on mobile sources. Uh, working with the Bay Area on how to collaborate, how to find common incentive money uh, that helps us both uh, achieve our goals. Uh, so again, uh, one of the reasons I think this was, was, was such a useful report is it, 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 it highlights um, our shared goals and a shared focus on success. So thank you for that. Thank you, and uh, we, we did, we we're good with the public comments. Okay, good. good. No further. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for the the very thorough um, presentation. You know, I think for our our new board members and the board members that have been here for a while, you know, these these this really is in the uh, really tight circle, the bullseye of of what we're after here. You know, not excluding public health. That's what we're about, but. From the challenges that we face, the significant amount of funding that flows through this agency, and and when I say significant, in the billions, you know, to meet some of the clean air challenges that we have, um, that funding is absolutely necessary. The you know being able to bring EPA and CARB to the table with respect to mobile sources and and uh, you know our responsibility lying in the uh, stationary sources. But, uh, you know, a lot of frustrations here and, you know, just looking back at, at um, you know, things like our PM 2.5 plan and, and going through the process with EPA and, and uh, being very frustrated that we never heard anything back from them and learning that, you know, well, you would think that they could either approve or disprove, and, but they also have the option of taking no action and they took no action. It's like, where does that leave us? And, and uh, so... This is really at the core of, of uh, you know, what we do here at the, at the district. And, and again, thank you for this presentation. And, and as board members um, and new board members, um, you know, the, the briefing that, you know, we're going to come up, will go into those things and where these plans even further are at. But, uh, but again, thank you for the presentation. With that, we'll move on to the next item. Item number 11 is authorized contribution of up to $37,500 in funding to Council of Fresno County Governments to support phase two inland port feasibility study. Mr. Chair and board members, I'd like to introduce Tom Jordan, our senior policy advisor, who's going to be providing a, a, quite the opposite uh, level, length of presentation, I think, <laughs> in the, with, this, with this item. <laughs> <laughs> What, no, same at level of energy, but much <laughs> shorter. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm going to try to finish this morning. <laughs> You're wasting time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I'm here to talk about uh, good movement here in the valley and, uh, and some, some studies that have been ongoing to, to look at ways to address those issues. And part of the reason that's important is that um, 
if we're going to meet our goals, as the last presentation uh, highlighted, we need uh, significant emission reductions from mobile sources to get there. 85% um, of the NOx in the valley comes from mobile sources. Heavy-duty trucks alone contribute to 40% 40, 40 of those emissions, and NOx is the key to both meeting ozone and PM standards. Um, the valley, uh, just because of where we're at, we are the main north-south corridor for the movement of goods on the west coast. Um, I-5 and 99 carry, uh, you know, any of you that have traveled those roads uh, have seen, sometimes it does look like a train uh, when, you, when you see the trucks going up with uh, goods up and down those two major corridors. Um, nearly all the goods that uh, leave the valley and go to the ports or come in through the ports um, are trafficked by heavy-duty diesel truck right now. About 95% of the goods on the West Coast that move are moved by truck. A relatively small portion right now is moved by rail for those kind of regional trips instead of the cross-country trips. Um, the valley, because of uh, where we're at and because of our location on the West Coast, is a uh, growing location for warehousing and distribution and log logistics businesses. Um, you know, the, we have a couple of major markets uh, just to the south and, and uh, kind of west of us up north, uh, that, and that's where the goods come in from overseas. And then uh, the, the warehouses tend to serve those large uh, population centers as well. Um, the, the current model of moving goods, um, while it's, it's, it's worked, it is not particularly efficient. Um, uh, there's, you know, uh, increased air pollution issues and cost associated with, with the way that happens. Um, I-5 and 99 carry about 80,000 trucks per day. Uh, m many of those are traveling to and from the, the seaports. Um, a lot of times trucks have to just drive to the seaports just to p pick up a container. We don't have any place in the valley where there's uh, a logical place to pick up those empties. So um, some of the trips, uh, if you're going to ship something, require two trips. You have to go pick up a container and then take the full container back to the ports uh, later. Um, also, because of the, the regulations on, on operator time limits for trucking, um, basically for the Southern California ports, anything north of about Fresno, you can't get down and back in a day because uh, the drivers have to take a break. So that really uh, impacts the efficiency <laughs> of that system. Um, so one of the concepts that's been brought about is developing an inland port. Um, here in the valley that would allow for uh, some of those transactions to happen here in the valley and uh, those goods to be taken to and from the ports uh, via rail. Um, the Air District Board has long supported this concept as a way to reduce emissions. Uh, we do a lot to reduce the actual tailpipe emissions from trucks, but if we're going to get to where we need to get to, we need that, that goods movement system to be more efficient and uh, look for better ways to move those goods. Uh, back in February of 2019, the board um, authorized uh, the staff uh, to work with the Fresno uh, or the Central Valley Community Foundation and some other folks. Uh, we provided $47,500 to do a phase one inland port feasibility study. Um, a number of counties here in the, the, the valley helped fund that. A couple of cities put in money. The ports uh, in Southern California put in money, as did the Southern California Air District. Uh, and that, that report was really just to look to see if this was something that should be studied further. Um, and what they found was that there's definitely a robust inbound and outbound market uh, that could support uh, an intermodal rail facility uh, to take goods to and from the port. Um, there's significant environmental benefits to that. Um, it was based upon current technologies, uh, each train could reduce emissions by up to 80%. Now that shifts over time as trucks get cleaner and rail, how clean rail gets, but there's definitely potential major, major uh, um, benefits to that. Um, also, they, they looked at just kind of a, could this make sense from a business model perspective? And it looks like it, it can, it could be economically viable viable, but that depends on a number of ways as far as how it's, how it's put together and how it works. Um, one of the keys, if this ever is going to happen, is the Class 1 railroads. Um, they have not been interested in regional transportation to date. Um, supposedly that's changing, uh, but any system like this, they would, they would have to buy into for that to happen. 
Um, but it's clear that, that this could have a lot of positive uh, impacts throughout California. And as part of the outcome of that study, um, the project proponents, we, we indicated that they really need to get the state of California on board. So they've actually gone and they've talked to um, the, uh, a number of government agencies in Sacramento, the State Air Resources Board, the Governor's Office of Planning and Economic Development, Caltrans, um, and then also uh, we wanted them to coordinate with the Valley Transportation Agency since there are air quality benefits, but at its core, this is a transportation project and the proponents have done that. So what are the next steps from here? Um, based upon the outcome of phase one and based upon the discussions that have happened since, since phase one was finished, um, there have been further discussions with the Valley COGS and state agencies, and there is support uh, from those entities to move forward uh, with a project. Um, and they've worked on a scope of work and um, based upon like opportunities at the state level, they've, they've broke the, the project moving forward into two uh, next phases. Um, phase two uh, would be to, you know, really look into the shipper uh, sector market requirements and, and see what kinds of goods this could work for. Um, look at sensitivity analysis as far as timing and cost to see uh, how much of the market they could, they could take. Um, look at the cost, um, environmental analysis. Uh, one of the things we really pushed for is uh, that they make sure they look at um, what kind of equipment they would use, uh, low, low emission car cargo handling equipment, potential low emission trucks coming to and from these facilities. So we're mitigating any localized impacts uh, and regional impacts from, from the, uh, the project. And this phase two of the study would be completed by, uh, would start this spring and would be completed by the fall. The estimated cost is about $250,000 um, and they have requested uh, 37,500 from the Air District. I'll talk in just a moment about the other funders and uh, that going forward. The next phase they're calling phase three uh, would start at the completion of phase two and would really get into discussions with the railroads, um, looking at capital cost um, and kind of getting really into the nitty gritty of how this thing could work. Um, the, right now, the way that would be funded, it's a proposal that would be submitted by Fresno COG on behalf of the eight Valley MPOs to Caltrans. Um, Caltrans has indicated there's a high likelihood of success. Uh, they, they really like the concept of this project. Um, and that would begin in the fall. And the estimated cost of that, cost of that phase is, is uh, $480,000 uh, funded by um, the Valley COGS and Caltrans. Um, and part of the reasons it's broken into two phases is just the timing of that grant and the fact that it can't be funded and it won't likely be funded till September. So for phase two, um, Fresno COG is acting as the fiscal agent and the coordinator of the project um, uh, for the Valley COGS. Um, they've developed a scope of work. Uh, contractor will be selected through an RFP. Um, the funding for phase two, um, both of the ports uh, down in Southern California have put in $80,000 a piece, so $160,000. The Sacramento Air District is committed to $15,000, and they're looking for uh, $37,500 from both the South Coast Air District and the Valley Air District. So staff's recommendation um, would be to uh, go forward with uh, a commitment to provide the 37,500 uh, to Fresno COG and authorize the executive director to work with the COG on an agreement with a signature by the, the chair, uh, pending the fact obviously <clears throat> that they get the other funding that they're looking for to fund uh, the phase two, uh, the phase two work. Um, one of the things that they've included in phase two to continue through phase three is a, so what I would call an executive committee and a steering committee to, uh, to, to work with the project as it moves forward. And the Valley Air District and the Valley COGS would be a part of that uh, steering committee. So we'd, we'd want to participate in that and make sure the study um, moves in an appropriate direction. Um, and then, obviously, once the study is completed, we'd, we'd bring a presentation back to your board uh, about the, the findings of the study. And with that, I would take any questions. Thanks, Tom. Even before uh, for time. Okay. 
Good job. Supervisor Wheeler. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And, uh, you know, this is this is a prime example of what how we could help on that uh, previous uh, presentation, because, you know, most of our uh, PM 2.5 now comes from the trucks and stuff going up and down our roads. And this will help get some of those trucks off if we could get this done. I think it's a great plan when they brought it to us last year or year before, whenever it was. I fell in love with it because bringing on, being on that rail compared to that many trucks on the highway, there's no, it's a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Mendes. Yeah, um, this is a great deal. I've been, I think, working on something with you guys for a long time with Supervisor Pereira. And uh, <clears throat> I actually have a, a private company that's actually – except for closing a couple of roads, closing a road, just about has this, you know, concept in the bag. But uh, it's going to be red tape with the Railroad Commission. So, you know, that's not an easy deal, and there's not a lot of cooperation with the railroads themselves. So it, this, this will help. Thank you. Supervisor Prayer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd, I'd like to also voice, uh, voice my support for us getting involved in this study. Um, we are we are, have continued uh, uh, working with the railroads because ultimately, like uh, Supervisor Mendes said, they're the they're the buy-in. The project, and they still seem to be moving forward uh, with uh, with you know what we're considering a castle. And so, um, you know, of course, this information would, would further our, you know, case with them. And, and so anyways, I'm, I'm glad that staff has brought it forward and that we could be involved. Thank you. I don't see any further comments from the board. Public comment? Through the chair, I see no public comment on this item. Okay, we'll bring it back to motion, motion to approve. approve. Or second. Okay. <laughs> We have a we have, <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bessinger? Yes. Mr. Chiesa? Yes. Mr. Couch? Yes. Ms. Fagazi? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Dr. Pacheco Werner, can you hear me? I'll come back. Mr. Pereira? Aye. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Dr. Sheriffs? Yes. Ms. Shucklian? Aye. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Aye. And Dr. Pacheco Werner? Here, I think she might have dropped off. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Item number 12 is a point ad hoc budget subcommittee. Mr. Chair, board members, quick uh, context on this one. Uh, the purpose of the item is to ask uh, the, the chair uh, to basically appoint a, an ad hoc subcommittee to review and provide direction on uh, on the uh, draft 2021-2022 district budget. Just a quick reminder on, on the process. Uh, we, we're required under state law to adopt our budget by June 30th. And we have a, uh, there's two public hearings that are part of that process. We have the the May hearing, which is where the, the proposed budget is basically presented to the board and to the public, strictly for public comment. And that returns to the board for action in June. One of the key steps that happens before that is for the the ad hoc subcommittee to receive a presentation on the draft uh, budget. And so that is the purpose of, of the item. And um, I think it's been tradition in the past and certainly uh, uh, up to the, the chair and, and the board in terms of who, who the members are in the subcommittee, but tradition ha has been to try to have combination of maybe some of the newer board members along with some of the, the more veteran board members be, be a part of that process is a great opportunity to really learn about the district's uh, finances, operations, and what we're looking to in the coming year in terms of the resource needs and upcoming uh, mandates 
So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, it's up to you to now help sure. establish this subcommittee. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and I would agree with Smear, um, you know, for new board members that want to learn more about how we fund this uh, this organization and, and the operation, it's, it's a great insight into uh, um, what we do here. And uh, so... Please step forward. If you don't, I'll pick you. I'll pick on you, and and uh, I'll put you on it. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fun. You get to hear the the budget three times, and and uh, and uh, may may even get a lunch out of it. <laughs> Mr. Chair, there isn't any policy on on this, but uh, traditionally it's been five to six board members to keep it below the the quorum level, and then a mix of preferably members from throughout the regions as well. Uh, but there's no set yes. numbers on, on that as far as the mix there. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Important point and good to have uh, regional uh, representation as well. So, um, yep. So Amy, I see your name up there. Oh. Well, I, I figured you'd call on me anyway, so I figured I'd beat you to the punch <laughs> and, uh, volunteer but no i i would be uh, honored to be a part of that and and uh, learn as much as i can thank you other members well i would do it if nobody else wants to if there's nobody from the central part but i've been honored a few times so it's either way for me if some of the new ones want to try to get educated they could volunteer too so either way yeah so that thank you with that being said i'd like to rescind uh, my uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Denied. Well, we, we don't allow that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we get, you know, and then, you know, we've got three possible here locally, and I'd like to look to the north and, and south possibly for, uh, the, you know, a couple more maybe. Mr. Chair, I have my mic on. This is Deborah Lewis from Los Banos. I'm not sure how to get acknowledged on this committee. Uh, if you have You're, to raise your hand, somebody please inform me how to do it. Um, yes. No, no one likes to hear budget items. Um, we all do sitting on boards of supervisors and city council. Uh, but I will volunteer coming from the north here on the committee. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mayor Preciado. So you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, since uh, I will volunteer, but since that you already have two from Central, so I will let it go to the north and the south. But in case you need another volunteer, I will volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're far enough south that you kind of bridge the gap there. No. I was just saying, yeah, since Yep. Yep. So. We have five. Any anybody else? Maybe one more, just for uh, in case one that can't be me. Oh, okay. hey, me and I have to. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for that, and uh, we'll move on to the next item, which okay. is another uh, request. Item number 13 is appoint ad hoc subcommittee for hearing board reappointments and approve interim reappointments of public members group. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Morgan Lambert, again, um, happy to bring forward uh, this uh, opportunity for extracurricular en engagement as well. Um, for those who have nothing to do. <laughs> luckily, this one, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, expectations is, is uh, not as engaged as the last but um, pursuant to uh, state law the district is required to have three hearing boards we have one that serves each of our, our regions the hearing boards here petitions for variances and permit appeals and other re related matters um, by statute each hearing board is made up of five members an attorney a registered professional engineer a medical professional and then two members of the public and there's both primary and alternate members that are appointed and we stagger the terms of those uh those groups uh, to make sure we have continuity of uh, board functions. And so where we sit right now is that the uh, current public members are set to expire at the end of this month. 
and consistent with past practice, uh, staff recommends appointing uh, two governing board members from each of the regions to serve on the, an ad hoc subcommittee to consider the, and evaluate reappointments. Basically what that entails is uh, um, we have uh, already surveyed uh, people that have appeared be before the hearing boards to get their, um, their evaluation of the members' performance, and then we also provide some recommendations uh, based on our experience as well for the, the board to consider. It's usually in the form of some email communications unless the, the members uh, want to go a little bit deeper dive into that. Um, we would also ask uh, in, in terms of taking a, an action today that because um, the, the members will expire and because they're the public members that have kind of a more significant number on the boards, we would recommend that the board authorize a, a three-month extension for the members' terms um, to ensure that there are sufficient hearing board members to satisfy meeting quorum requirements as we go through the process. So we need to develop new committee members and also extend? Right. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, and, and so regionality, north, central, south. You need two each. Two, three, three, three. Yeah. yeah, two from each. Okay. I'll, I'll do it with you, Craig. All right, thank you. So we got the central covered. Uh, Supervisor Chiesa said he would, uh, he had to drop off a meeting, but he said he would uh, participate. So um, from the north, and uh, Supervisor Prayer, I don't know if you want to possibly do that. Yeah, we'll draft you. Okay, <laughs> and then... Uh, from, yeah. Go ahead, Supervisor. And uh, Supervisor Reyes has his hand up. I mean, Mayor Reyes, sorry. And he's shaking his head yes, so. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 can, I can participate. Okay. So uh, maybe one more kind of south. I don't know if is, uh, Supervisor Couch still on line yes so I, couch. South, so I guess I'm on chair Peterson I think uh, Monty was signaling for a uh, sinker or a fastball I couldn't tell which it was I'm not sure you're volunteering <laughs> yep we got him all right uh, and then uh, a motion to extend would be appropriate this time. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Through the chair, oh, public comment. We oh. need to call for public comment. All right. And I see no public comment on this item. Again, I felt that. <laughs> Mr. Bessinger? <laughs> yes. And Mr. Chiesa has left the meeting. Mr. Couch? Yes. Ms. Vagazzi? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Dr. Pacheco Werner? Yes. Mr. Pereira? Yeah. Mr. Preciado? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Dr. Sheriffs? Yes. Ms. Shucklian? Aye. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yeah, I would. Motion passes. Item 14 is verbal report on California Air Resources Board activities. Uh, so, Dr. Pacheco Warner, traditionally, um, this, this would be your item. I, I know that there wasn't a board meeting in, in January, so that the, the, the memo that's attached to the, the agenda, I think, lists some of the upcoming matters, but I, I wasn't sure if you want to add any, any additional um, comments. Nope. Okay. No, On thank you, item. except I missed the other oh. vote because I was, um, we're trying to figure out that my turn mess and, and make mm. it work for our county. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Item 15 is Executive Director APCO comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and th thank you, Dr. Pacheco Warner, on, on, the, on that front as well. Uh, I just had one that I wanted to, to raise, uh, and it, it was alluded to earlier by Supervisor uh, Chiesa, but I just want to let the, the larger board know that uh, we are indeed, uh, based on, on the Chair's excellent idea and conversations that we've been having on, uh, on uh, trying to uh, bring the newer board members, and uh, we're, we're now at, at five, including Dr. Pacheco Warner, going back to, to August, I, I believe. Uh, 
of, you know, uh, quite, quite a bit of turnover on the board. So we're, we're hoping to schedule about two sessions uh, to uh, provide, you know, e even more background information on, on some of the, uh, the district's uh, role, regulatory role, other roles that we play, and, and some of the key issues r regarding air pollution background to try to help uh, prepare and accelerate the, the learning curve for, for the newer board members. So I just want to let the larger board know that um, that is something that's in the works and uh, of course we'll uh, keep you posted and hopefully that's a productive and helpful ex exercise for the, the newer board members. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. Okay, very good. Um, so any further board member comments or announcements? Supervisor Mendez? Yeah, I just uh, want to let Dr. Pacheco know that I'm going to, me and, Brian, and Supervisor Pacheco are going to be sitting down with Dave Palmerville tomorrow, and Manuel Cunha is supposed to be there, and we, we will tell him that he's going to have to figure out how we're going to get people processed <laughs> under this my term, because a lot of people are going to need help, and especially in the ag community. So we'll make it happen. Yeah. However I can help, let me know. Okay. Well, you might have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's that's true, man. It's it's frustrating. I know in Kings County we had figured out a list, and and uh, there's no way to integrate the old list into the new list. So those people that took the steps to to do the right thing and get on the list to get uh, the vaccination, now we have no way to, and, and we have to switch to the the my turn system. And and so yeah, it's it's truly frustrating, but. Uh, Thank you for the comment, Supervisor uh, Mendes. Uh, other comments, Mayor Reyes. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention uh, today is kind of a sad day in Porterville as it's, it marks one year since our library fire and uh, the tragic loss of uh, Captain Figueroa and Firefighter Jones. So if you could today just uh, have some thoughts about the sacrifices and actions of all first responders and we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Will do. Any further comments? Seeing none, and we have no uh, closed session today. So uh, thank you all for joining us, those in the public and our, our board <coughs> members. Uh, another great meeting and, and everybody working together to, to pull this wagon down the road. So uh, again, thank you all, and, and we'll see you soon. Meeting thank adjourned. You.